Although my guest today is known and celebrated the world over for his work as an actor, producer, writer, director, and one of only two men in history to win back-to-back -back Best Actor Academy Awards. Try that again. The dossier we've compiled suggests that his earning the Best Actor Trophy at Skyline High School in 1974, as well as the Best Actor Award at the Cleveland Critics Circle a few years later, did far more to shape his life and career, if not destiny. Please welcome a descendant of our very own Abraham Lincoln, Mr. Tom <laughs> Hanks. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Was it 74? Was it 74? Was seven, no, it's 74 for high school, 78. 78. For great, 78 for the for Great the Cleveland. Shakespeare Festival. That's yeah. a big deal. We got a free lunch. Uh, <laughs> midday, which was which was magnificent. Yeah. Because, <clears throat> uh, man, when you're working a, a classical repertory theater, the free lunch is a rare, rare thing. And huge. But you're building sets, you're doing everything. Oh, uh, well, as an intern, I did. The first year I was there, yes. We were there essentially in order to dodge union regulations and uh, change <laughs> over the sets. And we did some building, but mostly we're there to run the shows, change the sets over, because Vincent Dowling wanted to keep the... Uh, the season in rotating repertory theater. For those of you who don't remember what rotating repertory It was kind of cutting. Yeah. You'd, you'd mount six shows and you would do one show on a Tuesday night and a different show on a Wednesday matinee, change the shed over to a different show that night. So you had six shows that were running continuously. This wasn't done often, I'm guessing. Well, it was prohibitively expensive, provided you did not have a bunch of interns to do the money for it, either for free, which mm. I started off for, for, for no cash, sort of like your podcast, and then we <laughs> moved on to... Uh, some people got like 45 bucks a week, which was all the difference in the world. But we would not get any free meals unless, say, a benefactor of the theater brought in a bunch of chicken wings or something like that. So how long had you been doing shows for the Cleveland? Uh... I was there for three seasons. I did, there, I did 77, 78, and 79. So, so you just won the award in seventy. I seven. Yes, I joined the equity company at the end of my first season there, right. uh, and then was then had a good season in seventy eight, and then played lousy roles in seventy nine. That's pretty much the way it was. <laughs> right. And there's a lot of bad roles in Shakespeare. As there it are, turns out, and I played almost all of them in nineteen seventy nine. There's one guy in Twelfth Night. This is this is notoriously uh, for all you erudite uh, podcasters. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's the role of Fabian, mm. uh, who is, uh, he's known as being the tender of the dogs, Fabian, literally, like the song Fabian. Sure. And he's one of the comedic trio of uh, Festy, uh, Fabian, and I don't know, some other guy. Some other, the other Some other bad part. Mm -hmm. And we have to sit there and laugh uproariously. Well, maybe it's, I don't know. Anyway, we, have to, we have to laugh uproariously as... Um, uh, uh, yeah, the, other the actor that was nine. Barney Cates reads the, reads the fake letter that we that we leave for him. Right, and they have a line. Fabian has a line, mm -hmm. and this is how we were told to deliver. Actually, the director was Dan Sullivan, who is you know very well regarded on Broadway. Wow. Um, uh, he said, uh, "We said, what's the secret of this famous box, box tree scene for me and uh, me and uh, Festy and Aguecheek and uh, uh, Toby Belch." says, well, just say the lines like they're the funniest things you've ever ever heard in your life and, and laugh uproariously, which is a great piece of direction, yeah. except for when the line is literally, Souter will cry out on it, though it be as rank as a fox. <laughs> <laughs> that was the line I had. I do love that you remember the, this. Oh, it, you remember the painful ones. Yeah. My God, it was terrible. Bring that, bring that bad boy. Don't, don't over be afraid. Here. Just don't march it on it. in. We'll pretend we're in Germany. There you go, That's my right. friends. <laughs> and by the way, on a Sunday, what could be better? Hey, look, everybody, I'm Canadian. <laughs> For one day, if not. That's fantastic. This is how Canadians go to the Grey Cup Canada football games. Is that they right? Literally, they carry beers in both hands. Instead of mittens. <laughs> they yeah, just it was interesting. Beer. Yeah, I guess in order to uh, you know to you know to, to really make it clear. to equalize the, uh, the 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 pain. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. I will sip one of these. Not a sponsor. As soon as this man, not a, there are no sponsors <laughs> on this. By the way, I love uh, uh, Cards Against Humanity. That's a great game. I just played it last week with my with my one of my kids. Yeah. Truman it's and fun. his pals. His pals from school. Nice. Yeah. And it was your first time playing the game. Yeah, I didn't even know what it was. What are you guys doing here? There's always a game. You have a card for humanity, a card against humanity. Anyway, it's a hilarious game. I recommend it highly. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you so, and you also find a little bit more about people playing the game. Do you? In a in a humorous. Well, I don't, only in their like what their sense of humor is. Right. Because right? some people play it very very straight. You know? Right. And there's other people that, that play it for comedic effect. Well, this, this uh, begs the question, if I may, since I'm the one asking them technically. Um, 
don't you think that we gather our friends by a similar sense of humor? Oh, my Lord, yes. Yeah. Um, the, all of our loved ones, don't yeah. you think? Yeah. Are, uh, the family don't have a choice. They, they're produced. But. No, offspring? Yeah. No, they're, 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 they're squat out of luck, aren't they? But uh, no, the people that we hang out with is all about the hang. This yeah. is what show business is. Is it not more than anything else? At a its great best. hang at its best. Yeah. It's a fabulous hang. I never understand when someone's off in their trailer if there's people to hang with on the set. Uh, I mean, if you need some time, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or if you're, like, just taking a nap, which happens more and more as the, as the years go by. <laughs> I do and, you know, know a, a lusty sandwich is a good thing to enjoy every now and again. Sure. And if you know what I mean by lusty sandwich. I think I do. I literally mean a good sandwich that is brought to you. And yeah, you yeah. Eat, you eat before lunch. Yeah. In but, fact, no, the hang of show business is, is it. It's yeah. the it's the uh, lollygag. It's I, the, I think it's I go from around. trailer to trailer knocking on the door and saying, do you want to? No? Okay. Until I find someone. The, the company thing that goes on. I now, <clears throat> I now try to have my trailer door open and all the windows open, because otherwise I feel like I'm in jail. This was one of the things I'll never forget about the great Sophia Loren on the Grumpy Old Men movies. Her trailer door was open every day, and she cooked pasta for the whole oh, crew God, one day. That? You know, it's that thing that just levels the playing field, I think, and uh, with the responsibility of being number one on the call sheet, low these many years now, that's pretty great that the windows and the doors. Oh, they've got to do it, because yeah. otherwise, otherwise it's a job as opposed to a life. And right. we're in it for a life. We're yeah. in it for the, the, the hang. Are yeah. we not? Um, yes. And the laughs. Yeah. And the comedy and the, and the joy and the love. Three out of those. I would vote for three out <laughs> of those. Would you just do your buffering face for me? <laughs> Did that get you? I, I was gone. I couldn't quite. I knew you were committed to something. I just, but then I saw, I turned and I saw buffering. It's funny because out of the corner of my eye, as you were looking at me, I saw seven people pointing at the monitor for you to check it out. Because then I almost broke thinking I've got to let him know that I'm doing this. And also, I'm not going to break until he I sees it. I thought it was magnificent. i got to tell you. I thought it was great. Uh, we paused just for a moment. The loss of Peter O'Toole today, December 15, 2013. You told me. Uh, if you've not seen them, folks, do yourselves an extraordinary favor and watch Lawrence of Arabia and my favorite year my back favorite to back. My favorite year. So many others uh, among the countless, if not uh, never-ending comments written about his performance in Lawrence of Arabia still considered the greatest debut of any lead actor in film history. Noel Coward shared his own perspective of O'Toole's place in film history by adding, if Peter had been any prettier, it would have been called Florence of a. No, oh. <laughs> he was a wit that day. Uh, yeah, he was. Um, also, our research uh, producer, Jason McIntyre, sent me an 81-page dossier uh, for you today, which is uh, technically a record. Um, so I like this uh, thing that you said on the NPR that I... Uh, um, on the NPR. On the NPR. Like the Internet and the YouTube? <laughs> the, in the Internet, yeah. yeah. It's the other thing that happens with the age. Well, it is the Internet, yeah. don't you say? But you hit 51 <laughs> and everything's the. The. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what did I say? Well, uh, getting to it here, we... Uh, always, oh, it's always dangerous when they say, you know, you gave an interview once, and I remember you saying, said, oh, my God, I understand. I'm just trying to get through interviews. It's all, <laughs> I'm not trying to say anything. I've rarely thought about these questions, and they come off like, you know, policy statements. Well, they were... This is not true, sir, that yeah, you yeah. once said. It's like, gee, <laughs> well, who am I being interviewed here by Channel 4 in England? Is it not true? Would you not agree? That's the thing I love. All right. Would you not agree? <laughs> Wait a minute, I'm just trying to figure out the, the, the syntax of this question. Would I not agree? You once said! Does that mean I do agree or yeah. that I think, I don't know what it is. It is a little bit of a double negative. You know what, we're going to skip that question. No, no, I'll bring it on. Oh, what, did no. I, what did I no, say no. on NPR? No, no, I, 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 listen, I'll face up. I'll try to, I'll try to talk, try Actually, my way out of it. Actually, it was about, uh, they asked the, what I thought was an annoying question, and I thought your answer was pretty cool, and that's why it sort of caught my eye. They were asking you what you thought Walt would think of your performance, oh, which yeah, just yeah, seemed yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. the worst possible Really? What? Well, so now I'm going to tell you well, what? Well, let me get out my Ouija board and, you know, <laughs> bring on, you know, Madame Tallulah, and she and I will divine what the dead spirit of Walt Disney would think. So instead of saying that to NPR, what which thank you for sharing here, you were, uh, you said, uh, I think he would have appreciated the suit and the mustache and the whatnot, but I think he would also say, hey, you didn't seem to be working very hard. Well, that's true. <laughs> and I thought that was terrific because the guy never stopped working, and apparently in the film, which I can't wait to, to see because I got the screener. The screener, baby. <laughs> yeah, no, we're gonna Free pay. movies. We're actually going to go. Uh, we made plans to go see it this afternoon in the theater. It is open now. In the it, theater. Open, it opened small. This, uh, on Seven Friday. theater. Not that I'm here promoting No, 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 no. I am not. <laughs> no. <laughs> this, I am here because of an off-the-cuff <laughs> remark I made four years ago. <laughs> this is why I am here. 
I ran into Senor Knucklehead over here, <laughs> complimenting him on his recent appearance on World Poker Tournament. <laughs> And I noticed I didn't say the World Poker Tournament. And uh, he you. says he's got a podcast. I said, hey, that sounds like fun. Let's try it. Four years later, <laughs> here am I. The, the timing is just ostentatious. Or yeah. Is. That's all I can say. Um, I thought but I that's had... not a bad, you know, that's... You, 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 well, uh, when you go out on, a, on what I call the celebrity mule train, yeah. there, the, all the questions really get down to whittle down to about five or six, eight at the most. Right. There is, you know, um, what drew you to this project? How did you pick it? Um, what were the challenges that you faced doing this? Um, what is it like working with blank? Right. And the other thing is like the generic, what do you think so-and-so would think of this? Yeah. And that was the Walt Disney thing. Of and Walt Disney was the busiest human being on the planet. Is that one of the things that you found in the research that basically he never stopped working? Well, he also loved everything that he did. Yeah. And, he, and he worked, I think, at the same pace. Understand, this was a guy that when he was in Kansas City making like goofy gag slides for the local movie theater, right. he did it in his garage by himself with pen and ink. And he just was always, he was always involved in everything like that. He never stopped coming up with something different. And the reality, I, I told uh, John Lee Hancock, I said, look, honestly, all these scenes should be me with like eight men in shirt sleeves, you know, smoking cigarettes and having coffee, arguing about something, yeah. you know. That's what they all should be, but they don't have room for eight people. And they, and they can't show people smoking cigarettes in a movie, otherwise it's rated R, I swear to God. And so it was always just me kind of like drawing on it. Oh, here's a script that I'm making notes. Here's some plans. And I'm looking at them. Hmm, well, we'll put Tomorrowland here. And well, if we buy more Florida property here, that's what it turned out to be. So wow. He was actually a very busy man. A nonstop. We're uh, nonstop. huge lovers of the Disneyland. There you, you go. With you the got little icon. Oh, I that is wonderfully placed with the uh, holding up the apple of the apple logo. There. Yeah, yeah. Lovely. We're a uh, 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 annual why? season pass holder. Really? Yeah, yeah. You can go anytime you want. She's got I the premiere. Guess. Wow. Yeah. I have the mega pass. The mega pass. <laughs> Do you, anything new down there? What have you noticed? Anything new down there? No, well, you know, Tim Burton throws up on the Haunted Mansion every year. He have you seen that? He throws up? He throws up. He up Why chucks? do you describe it like that? It's Haunted Mansion Holiday. And it's yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they do the Nightmare Before Christmas. And now, like, and, and uh, Pirates of the Caribbean is pretty much the, 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 fran the movie franchise, Pirates of the Caribbean. But right now they're in holiday time. So oh, we okay. have like, you know, it's a small world holiday. And they started this year Jingle Cruise, which is the Jungle Cruise has a holiday theme. Just very nice. Have very they magical. changed the pattern on the on the they, jungle? Yes, cruise? they changed the spiel for they the holidays. They can't do that. Just for the holidays, they'll change the pattern. <laughs> what do they say? <laughs> and that rhinoceros will get his gift in the end. What I don't understand I think, what it I could think be. That's, you pretty much said How could it be? <laughs> and here, too bad there's not a chimney on that lion cape. What I don't understand how they could. How could they change it like that? Well. They've, That's crass commercialism. They, oh, great. By the way, they peppered the, the regular puns. I'm going to be getting an email from Bob Iger. Did you really have to criticize the yeah. park? There is a reason on? I have an answer. That's what right. is it? What is it? The, the, there's about the. The people that go through the turnstiles each day, it's like 60 or 70 percent annual pass holders, so they have to constantly change things up in order to, to keep us going. I back. disagree. They okay. do not have to constantly change it up. It should be absolutely <laughs> pure from the way it came out, so you see it again and again and again. Because I've got go news back. for you. Every time you see Star Wars, it's the same friggin' movie. <laughs> And every time you ride on the Jungle Cruise, it'd be said, turn around and say goodbye to civilization. And two of you, two of his for one of yours, or whatever, whatever the regular pattern is. On the backside of water, it should always be. <laughs> I do love Always be the same. Well, I yeah. saw it just enough times. But as, an, as, a, as a season pass over, you want to see what, you know, how they've altered the... Uh... I, don't, I, I like that they change it up because they do change it back. But I also appreciate Disneyland more than Disney World because Disney World is so quick to get rid of an, uh, like a traditional attraction. Oh. And they ne will never do that. Disneyland. Like they got rid of the, the Snow White Dark ride because they need, they're like, we need more thrill rides, so we're going to put in a roller coaster. Here's an interesting <laughs> tidbit about the history of Disneyland because we Please. found out this stuff when we were there. When the when the, in the when Fantasy, uh, when he first opened it up, uh, he ran out of money, and so Fantasyland was not much more than like a two-dimensional kind of like almost like a county fair quality mm. attractions. The the rides were fun, and they had the carousel, and the carousel had multicolored horses. And they discovered that the line was blocking up and they were getting less, less rides in per day because kids wanted particular colored horses. They wanted to be on the red horse or the black horse or the green horse. And so it, it just mucked up the work. So they have now painted every horse white 
and so you can get on and you have a white horse, maybe with green bells and things like that, or red, big, but now all the horses are white. So they never stop toying with the psyche of the, of the people. Now, I got no problems with that, because that's, that's just better, quite frankly, ride engineering and management. <laughs> that's right. But that's the changing of the pattern is this, this makes me, this makes me berserk. <laughs> like I went on, I remember going on, news. I hadn't been on it for a long time, and I went down with the kids, and we went on the submarine ride, which is not really a ride. Nope. The submarine is literally, it's like a submarine. I yeah. mean, it, it's on rails, but you're underwater in a, in, a, in a watertight, you know, they had to build those things. They're like, they're like ships. And they changed all of the, the wonders of the deep, uh, that kind of uh, the audio track to kooky underwater sound effects with like splish splash, I was taking a bath and uh, a it was just, it was not the same ride whatsoever. I wanted, I wanted literally to be on the Polaris going under the thing. I'm yeah. Disneyland purist. When the, well, yeah, and historian about most things. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to have me a little sip of cranky juice. <laughs> Happy holidays. Well, great. So now today will be known as the day that I made Tom Hanks cranky. <laughs> <laughs> hey, here's one for you. Why did you hate Bear Levinson's film Avalon so much? Oh, stop <laughs> it. <laughs> is it. Oh, is it just don't. <laughs> okay, do you know, do you know, I'm going to tell you something. Do you remember this? Um, you were hosting should SNL? I, should I go through a 12-step process? <laughs> I would make amends to you because literally of that. You do remember of that? No, I remember it very well because like three hours later, I thought, what did I just do? I just took off on this guy's, he's in a movie for God's sake. The sakes. first big the one. The first big one, well, but one of Willow. the first of many. Willow was You would have done it. some others. And all I did was, because I, I just seen it, you know how people are when, you see, when they see movies, all you do is riff on the movie you just saw. That's right. And I riffed on that far too long and just, I was, I was, a, I was, a, a, I was an ass. I was impressed. No, you with, were not. With the anger you had towards this incredibly loving movie. It's actually a beautiful movie. <laughs> it's a but filled, <laughs> but filled with the ire of, hey, I went to college, I know about films. I thought, right. oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, it's right. certainly not Diner, you know. It's <laughs> like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I'm sorry, because it was about 40 minutes in Dana Carvey's office, yes. was it not? Yes, you do remember. I wow. do remember it, yes, yes. Well, listen, you more than made up with it by uh, allowing me some historical moments in Earth of the Moon <laughs> and that thing you do. There so you it, all, it all you came were, full circle. Uh, you were the only choice. Uh, well, let's talk about that, the casting process, because I remember showing up on the set of that thing you do and seeing Charlize Theron's uh, photo, and it was a photo of her in period uh, uh, hair and makeup for the Officially movie. Officially, Charlize's second movie. Right. She had made Three Days in the Valley. Two Days. Two Days, whatever it was. It was, was originally the three. Like that. They cut one yeah. of them. Yeah. But the, her photo was right there on the, uh, by Video Village. And I just walked up uh, and saw the photo and said, oh my God, what is that? Who? Because she looked like a starlet from yeah. yesteryear. Yeah. And not, so. You were just in the casting process, and oh, she made the most sense, kind no, of. No, I remember very specifically because she was. I swear, this is there. There is no hyperbole in this. She was the first actor I read in the casting process, and she came in, and um, uh, she dressed. You know, she's she's smart in that she's sort of dressed. Not identically like, but she's had a hint of period about her. Right. And talking to her, she was a formidable physical presence, mm -hmm. as well as a psychological one. She's confident. That is a confident woman who's very sure of herself. Yeah. And I said, well, look, um, I think you might be really good for the, for the role of, uh, of Tina. She said, uh, she says, I am Tina, but I'd like to read for Faye, which was played by, by, um, by Liv. Liv. Liv, yeah. Uh, and uh, and she read, and I said, oh, "Listen, you are so fantastic. It's just great, but I, you're a little too sensational in order to be yeah. to be Faye. So you'll be team. And but it was like I thought, well, this is going to be easy. Let's see, I've got <laughs> I've got role? six roles I have to cast. I'll meet with six people, and and uh, and that will be it. Pollock will certainly take my call." <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you just had it. Didn't we just? Didn't I just call you? Up? Yes, you did just call, and I said, "Don't tell me who else you called before me." Now there was nobody else. It was uh, it was you and you alone. Only I could do those roles. As boss, boss, Vic Koss. And I love that you uh, pronounced it uh, Koslovich. Koslovich a little bit right. later on. Yeah. But I do have a question about. Uh, uh, Ethan's on uh, credit as the bass player. Yes, he is uh, one of the leads, arguably. Yeah, and yet, the name of the character in the credits. TB player. 
<laughs> TB player. We, I thought it was funny that no one ever called him by a name. No. So they just called, hey, where's your bass player? Right. <laughs> That's all they referred to him. Because it felt in, in keeping with the sort of spirit of the time? Well, there's always a band member that you're not sure who they are. I mean, outside of, outside of the Beatles and perhaps the Rolling Stones, I mean, a handful of others. By and large, there's guys in the band, there's a front person and there's other people, you right. know. I mean, quick, name, name the other Supremes. Uh, no, well, sir. I mean, you know, there's, there's a, there were, I believe Nancy Wilson was one and Diana Ross, and I'm sure someone out there is screaming the name of one of the many third Yeah, I'm Supremes. going through the bass players in my mind already of all the other there's a, Yeah, bands. there's a lot of bands. So I just thought it was hilarious that he just never had. A, never had. And, and the replacement uh, was the Wolfman? Uh, yeah. The Wolf, yeah. <laughs> uh, Jack, uh, what was it? Scott Pell. Wolfman Scott Pell. Yeah. We, had a, uh, we had the painful screening, uh, um, uh, what a recruited screening process of the movie, right. which never tells you anything. The yeah. card process never tells you anything because the way the audience feels and listens to the movie is the movie. That, yeah. There's no there's no changing around. They always do that card thing and the guy who runs the research group, you know, says, does anybody have any, any problems with the film? What were some of your favorite scenes? What, what did you do? What did you do? Does anybody have any real problems? And one guy, any problems with the film? And one guy shot his hand up. He says, yeah, yes, the bass player doesn't have a name. I said, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that you even recognize that. I thought I was the only one who got that. And, and I passionate. Was, I was, I mean, he was very upset. <laughs> Former bass player. <laughs> What's yes. It was Gary Talent of the uh, right. Timothy of the, B. Of, Schmidt of the uh, Bruce of the E Street Band. He, uh, he just he was really pissed off, and yes. that I know that Gary. You know, hey, I just uh, a napkin, please. Please, I, somebody. I hey, so let my, me ask you about the Genesis, though. Was it just your love of the music of that time? The Genesis uh, for, for writing and directing. This there piece? was there was there was a. Um, I, I was I, I lived and died. Uh, I was the youngest of of three. <laughs> Three kids who were living alone in a small apartment in Alameda, California. My sister, all of her friends, right. and my older brother, all of her friends, all, right. <laughs> all of his friends, and me. And it was the it was the we were just in the maw of the British invasion. I became a socially conscious human being about 1963, 1964, and that's when the Beatles arrived. Yeah. And I was convinced that other bands were just as good as the Beatles. I thought that Dave Clark Dave Five Clark were Five. actually a little better than yeah. the Beatles. For a and all the other things that came along, I just said, well, that, that's just as good. So it was a very rich... Chad and Jeremy? Uh, they were nice. They were better than Jan and Dean, but I loved Jan and Dean at the time, man. I, yeah. I went through a huge Jan and Dean phase. So, but... This was unique, and I'm not. I don't want to. I don't want to sound like an old guy, but it was Too unique late. because the radio that we all listened to had every type of genre of music playing on it. I grew up listening to Johnny Cash and Motown and uh, 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 other country western artists, uh, uh, Floyd Kramer, uh, like uh, jazz. We listened to Vince Guaraldi. All these people had hits, and it was part of part of what we listen to. It's not like a different type of chart, a different type of, you know, genre or whatever radio station was. Yeah, they hadn't broken it up. So the, mu the music I just absolutely adored. And um, uh, I, I had heard this story about a guy, um, uh, uh, when the Beatles made, I think, their second tour of Australia and Japan, Ringo got sick. And they just, they replaced him for about eight or nine gigs right. with a guy, a drummer named Jimmy Nichols. They just replaced him. He's playing with the Beatles at the at, live at the Budokan and places like that. And he was in the parades, and they all said John, Paul, George, Ringo. They didn't even change his name on the thing. It was so. The, and I just thought that guy had a pretty interesting ride there for a while. And so I took that and transposed it to because uh, the story of that thing you do is the the drummer breaks his arm, and so this right. like, guy Patterson shows up and ends up and he ends up being on live TV, and his life changes because uh, he could play the drums and keep a beat. Yeah, and it just came out like that. But you co-wrote some of the songs as well. Uh, I, yeah, I wrote some of the lyrics of the goofy, not the real songs, the more interstitial goofy stuff. Right. I didn't uh, write the hits. And um, I didn't write like "Drive Faster" or uh, oh, the, "I Need You" Mr. or that Downtown. thing you do. I actually wrote "Mr. Downtown." Did you really? Yeah, I wrote "Mr. Downtown." It's one of our favorites. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote "Mr. Downtown." I wrote uh, uh, "Hold My Hand," hold, uh, hold, hold, hold my hand, hold my heart. I know the heart. choreography to that. I wrote that. I, I love wrote... that movie. It's so magical. No, yeah. Oh, that's lovely. No, it... I wrote the theme to the Hollywood Television Showcase. Did you? I wrote, I wrote a bunch of. That? Oh, it was a, it was, it was, it was as much fun as I've ever. I don't trust it when anybody says it was the most fun I've ever had because yeah. there's a lot of fun to be had in this kooky gig. Yeah. Like but... today and. Um, <laughs> 
And uh, it was As just fun. it was just a incredibly vibrant time. And I must say that um, I can. My son was born uh, during the Christmas break, the one that I have since played, you know, uh, Cards Against Humanity with. He was born, I can literally show you, between the Mercyhurst College talent show right. and uh, whatever comes next, uh, right. that my son was born during that, during that break. And then your oldest, uh, first son, I think has a small part. Yeah, he plays a page that shows, uh, that shows uh, uh, Liv Tyler to yeah. her seat. Yeah. 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 Um, my daughter's in a, in, a, in a shopping scene, you know. That's what you slap your kids in that, just so you can see them well, that, <laughs> when you're directing a movie. Well, that was the it's thing. Because a merciless job. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I, I, one of the reasons I asked about the Genesis is because I, I have to assume, not even checking the dossier, that you had been asked to direct uh, a few times, if not many, prior to that. And, and this was one... I, I'm not an instinctive director. I, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not like almost every director I've ever met where that had just like, like a major boner about directing. I, 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 I was... It, acting is an instinctive thing right. that you don't have to talk about. You just do it, you know? Right. Directing was... was a, I, I got involved in... Uh, I started doing that thing you do because... because um, <clears throat> the, the celebrity mule... I swear to God, the celebrity mule train... Right for Forrest Gump right. started in June, and it did not end until the following March. Jeez. And I was in the middle of that thing, and I thought I was going insane Sure. from this kind of like white-hot brand of, of, of attention. Yeah. And I, I just needed a, a creative break from that, and I was traveling all over the country and all around the world, so I started developing this, this idea, and I ended up writing it. Then once you write it, and if you like it, well, then you're doomed, because... <laughs> You don't want to hand it over to some knothead director who's going to screw it up and say, if anybody's going to screw it up, it's going to be me. Yeah. And so that's, that's the way that happened. Right. It was enough of, uh, hey, look at me. You, you wanted to... I wanted to disappear into something a little, a little bit as much as possible. Right. And, you know, the movie did fine. And it's actually... What's amazing about these films was, and that was made at a time when you weren't absolutely sure movies would live forever. That's right. You know, because uh, eventually they go into a bargain bin, you know, and they, they do disappear. Yeah. No, you don't know. Sure. Okay, well, we all do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but now, you know, you got to admit that, you know, that's out there and is visible. And I now meet little kids who have, you know, asked me questions about, you know, the bass player and, yeah. and you know, why Lenny said, I am, hey, Skitch. Why did Lenny call Guy Skitch all the time? <laughs> what is and that? Why, well, because I just thought of, like, Skitch Henderson. Yeah. You know, he probably sat up and watched The Tonight Show. So right. Skitch Henderson. Uh, who was the leader of the Tonight Show band uh, before uh, Doc Sevens. Yeah. I will have you and, know, I saw that movie twice in theaters, so there. Twice in theater. Twice. And that's the thing mm -hmm. I noticed in the dossier, we, you, uh, we're talking about uh, um, the Kubrick film, 2001. 2001 A Space Odyssey. You uh, claimed to have seen it 22 times in the theater. I, uh, in a theater. In a theater. 22 times, I mean, that's like, and I, actually you can add one because they just played it on the new 4K projector at the Arrow about mm -hmm. a year ago and I saw it there. And I swear to God, I saw stuff I had never seen before yeah. because the digital projection was so clean. How great is that, Arrow? We went to see Planes, Trains, Automobiles on, oh. on uh, was it Thanksgiving Eve? Yeah. Oh yeah, just recently, yeah. yeah. I saw that on the marquee. Yeah. yeah that's pretty neat. Who, who spoke? Did somebody speak at it? Did they come off and talk about no, it? No, but it was no, strange. But, John um, Candy's daughter. Daughter and, and, and wife. And, and, and the, oh. uh, the son. Son. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. We're just in attendance. They didn't get up mm -hmm. and say anything. But, but yeah, that, uh, so that's pretty great. Um, well, that's the thing. Uh, when people are passionate about a film, there's no talking them out of it. So the people who love a movie like that of yours, they, they're going to hold it dear till the end of time. Oh, and I've got movies that I do that of, you know, other sure. people's films, like Fargo and stuff like that. I can watch that movie a hundred million times yeah. and just see something new in it. What have you seen this year that you like? I'm a little behind the curve. I've seen inside, speaking of the, the Coens, who, the bastards, who will not give me another job. I don't know why. I, I you know, I did the, the lady killers for them. Yeah, you sure did. In fact, I have here Sophie's Choice, one of the Coen brothers has to die, which one? <laughs> <laughs> Gun to your head. You gotta pick one. Man, oh man, really? Yep. Gotta pick one? Gotta pick one. <laughs> Ethan? Yep. That's the correct answer. That's the correct answer. That's the correct answer, by the way. That was, you I, got it right. I ran into, I ran into, uh, I, I ran into Joel. 
I ran into Joel at a, at a thing in New York, and uh, I didn't even let him say hello to me. I said, come on, what did I do? <laughs> That's all I did. Come on, I went back in. Yeah, you You've got a repertory company. I went back in that thing. You work with Clooney every other week. They are, look, they, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are truly peerless. Their, their movie, Inside Lewin Davis, is, is, is magnificent. I saw uh, August Osage County, which is sensational. Yeah. I haven't seen, what haven't I seen? American Hustle is pretty I haven't seen American Hustle. Spectacular. I haven't seen, uh, I've seen 12 Years a Slave, which is one of the most mind-boggling, gripping, depressing movies you've ever seen. And magnificent. You know, I'm just talking as sure, an audience member sure. who's, who's moved by it. Um, I, I, I saw a couple of other two things. You know what I saw recently? I'm late to the game. Please. Sports documentaries. Harvard beats Yale 29-29. Oh, yeah. Have you seen that? Yeah. That is... One of the most elegant, it's beautiful, it's elegant, simple, and the football looks fantastic in it. A videotape of a game from 1968, 67. Yeah, uh, yeah 60, I think 60. And you know the game ends a tie, but your heart is in your mouth the entire, it's a magnificent, I can't recommend it highly enough. And it's got Tommy Lee Jones in it, oh, who wow. was an offensive lineman for the Harvard football team. Oh, wow. How about that? Roommate of Al Gore. Roommate of Al Gore is one of my favorite trips. And a picture of one of the Yale football players whose girlfriend was Meryl Streep. What the? I know. It's a, it's a, I can't recommend it highly enough. I think it's on Netflix. It is. No, it, no it's, yeah, it is. It's either Netflix, Netflix or the other or thing. It's Amazon, or you can find it streaming. One of those. I've had, I've had bad luck with the Netflix. I'm sorry. Because every time I go on there, let I. Me, let me come down and look at your system. <laughs> because it's clearly. Uh, because first of all, we had to get the whole password username yep, thing down. This is human error, is what I'm going to suggest. Which though. is like when the guy who sets it up, he says, oh, I, I gave you a password. Oh, what is it? It's 2KQ, small case, IWD. Plus, I said, I'm never going to remember that. Can you not just put forest down yeah. as my, my, uh, my password? Can you not just do that? Yeah. Can it just be Apollo 13 and I can remember what the password is? It never works Tom out that way. Three. But every time, just... I, every time I go into Netflix, I'm trying to find something that at one time or another played on HBO. Right. And that's a no-no. No, no. They don't, they don't, HBO stuff is not on Netflix. No, that's what we've got to get at the HBO Go. And I have. Yeah. It turns out I have that. Who knew? Yeah. I was not told I had. <laughs> well, because the guy who gave you the but password. Now, and now I'm going back and watching The Wire, which I missed oh, the first time it came out. Yes. Oh, we're into something great here, my friend. How deep are you? I am on episode four of the first season. Oh, my. So and I'm driving my family insane. I've got the best news for you. I have it all to look forward to. It Those are better. the hardest four episodes to get through. Are you kidding? No, I no. swear to you. Oh, then I'm home free. That's, yeah. that's, you're climbing the roller coaster. The all rest right. Of its coaster. I all actually right. envy the uh, innocence of having not yet seen it. The Wire? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it, re it is reminiscent of uh, some of your work when, uh, when you, know, you were playing non-Jews. <laughs> <laughs> Which is how he described usual suspects. For, to him. <laughs> running, you run, oh, I'm running around with a machine gun? Jews don't do this. Nope. Uh, you know what? They do in some countries. Well, yeah, I mean, they call it a six day war because we, we needed a day to rest. Um, now I'm going to have a little bit, another sip of cranky. Juice. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's talk about this on the award front because I've not seen The Wolf of Wall Street except for a couple of scenes. I haven't seen it either. Yeah. Um, uh, Okay, so you've worked with DiCaprio, and one of my absolute favorite, yeah. favorites of yours, uh, Catch Me If You Can. Catch Me If You Can. Is this kid, is it the movie star status that has undermined the fact that he is a truly brilliant actor? Well, I think, yeah, I think he is a brilliant actor, yeah. and, I, and I think he's proven that again and again and again. Because, uh, you know, he was a kid actor that I don't recall seeing. Although, Gilbert Grape. Well, that was it. But I think prior to that, he was actually in the TV version of Parenthood. He played one of the kids. Do you know this? Perfect. There you go. The TV, the first go round of Parenthood. Right. TV. Um, but as soon as you saw him in Gilbert Grape, you just say, okay, all right, he's one of the 5%. He's yeah. just one of the 5% brilliant guys. Yeah. And I've never seen him do anything that wasn't fascinating him somehow. So, and, you know, I think he's, he's maintaining uh, the mystery that I have let lapse out of the bottle. I, well, have, I have none whatsoever. you didn't have to worry about the pretty thing that other co-star Paul Newman, it befell him for many years. It didn't matter how great the work he was. It, initially, it was he's, he's just a handsome movie star. This is what yeah, I'm suggesting. Too good. That, yeah. And Redford, for that part, who I think probably wins this year for an entire career. I think it might be one of those years. He rates, without a doubt, without yeah. a doubt. But he's, I've always thought he was a fascinating actor 
uh, in. I mean, you don't have not just for the for the big hits, but some. Well, I mean, three days of the three Condor of or Condor. something. Like, and I, honestly, if you look for him for pound for pound, the performance that he gives in the way we were. Oh yeah. Is this is one of the most subtle? I mean, he puts on a clinic of yeah. how to act for in the cinema. Yeah, and also how about because uh, Butch Cassidy Sundance Kid was for me the 2001. I saw it That's 13 a, times in the theater. It, it's a me, hip it's, movie. It's a perfect. Holds up. Oh, Hill holds up well. He and Newman end up giving back more individually between Newman's own oh, yeah. and the Sundance Institute. And the Sundance, Institute. yeah. That all came out of that. Uh, yeah, it kind of came out of that. Historical yeah. levels. Yeah. Um, to, to what? To whom much is given, much is owed? What is, what is it? Staff? Don't look out here. Much is owed? No help is there. Sure. They're much gonna is go, owed. They're going to go to their phones. Meaning much that if you've had good fortune, you've you, you got to give it back. Right. Um, and for you, I'm guessing this may have been an, uh, exceptionally important. The Distinguished Public Service Award, the highest award the U.S. Navy can offer a civilian. Uh, that must have been. That was nice. Yeah, that was that was you know that was in tandem to all essentially uh, the, all the sort of like veteran World War II attention that we. Uh, yeah, that's not a, something a publicist almost. goes after though. No, no. Or a student <laughs> for your consideration. <laughs> no, they didn't. That was that was just a that was just a very nice thing. Yeah. We got there were there was some stuff that was like that, that someone thought that we had been given the Congressional Medal of Honor. Sure. And and there was like argument, you know, like how dare how about I think folks, it was not the Congressional Medal of Honor. It was like it was literally thank you for making the movies and bringing some attention oh, to it. Oh yeah. Was very nice. I think it might have been. And a matter of fact, Steven Spielberg and I got that together, and we were on. Uh, we were on a uh, we were on a, a, a ship uh, in uh, I want to, might have been no it was in Norfolk it was somewhere in we were on the the SS Normandy and we had a a, a, a thing on there we were there for something else but they gave us that and we helped celebrate the, yeah. helped swear a guy back into the Navy who was re upping and stuff right and also the thing where you brought the veterans after Saving Private Ryan to back to Normandy. Yeah, yeah, we did that. And a lot of, uh, we just lost like three of those guys just, just recently. Babe Heffron died and Earl McClung died. Well, they're going to um, be in their 90s. I mean. Yes, they're, they're yeah. We, uh, major winners died a, a, a year, about a year, eight months ago. That was, yeah, tough. Yeah. It's hard to. But what know, an extraordinary. They were, uh, yeah, they're, you know. Thing. Time is relentless and uh, their, their time came. But they were. They were astonishing guys. They were they were fabulous. When we were doing a Band of Brothers uh, in in England, we shot it at the same sort of abandoned airfield as we shot um, uh, much of uh, Saving Private Ryan. And so we had like villages built all over the place, and uh, two units were going simultaneously. So there were always about a hundred guys in uniform, actors in uniform, shooting two different things. Right. And uh, uh, Babe Heffron and Wild Bill uh, 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 showed up, uh, uh, and and Bill only has one leg. Sure. Because <laughs> he lost he lost one in Belgium, and when he's over in Belgium, like he sees, he, like they go off and tour the tour the literally the, the the forest where it's all still there. You can still see it. And he says, "Hey kid, if I give you five bucks, go in that forest and find my leg for him." <laughs> Got this thing of it. Uh, but when they showed up, man, it was it was it was like uh, it was like Lennon and McCartney were there. They everybody just came running out of every costume shop, yeah. transportation, apartment. Suddenly there was like three hundred people around to look at these old guys sure. sit on a jeep. Yeah. And say, uh, hey, how are you, kids? How are you? Well, there's the actors in costume, and then there's pretty you know, great. Those yeah. two, yeah, yeah. Um, well, this I, I, there's so many of the quotes over the years that actually here's the babe that actually led that. Yeah, yeah. Here's the babe. You can spill it on the floor. And a, sing, and a singular leg <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> well done. Somewhere in the forest. I am a lay historian by nature. I seek out empirical reflection of what truth is. I sort of want dates and motivations, and I want the whole story. But I've I would have taken out empirical and sort of. I would have taken out a couple of words. Sure, sure. That. I'll give you a chance to rewrite it. That's why I'm sharing it now. <laughs> but I've always felt unconsciously that all human history is that connection from person to person to person, event to event to event, from idea to idea. Yeah, that is the deal, isn't it? I th yeah, I think that's why w I keep going back in the company and saying, hey, here's this, here's this piece of history that no one's really ever talked about. Uh, and it's always, um, it's always recognizable human behavior. Uh, I think it always comes out, well, I'd do that. Oh, that sounds like something I would do. And we live today with all, with all the encumbrances of, uh, of modern life. And it's not that much different from decisions people made in, you know, 
in uh, back at a time when it took three days to get from Philadelphia to New York, you know. Right. Or, you know, you had to, no one had ever, you hadn't been outside of your town uh, in your entire lifetime, and next thing you know, you're parachuting into, uh, <clears throat> into Normandy. That was the astonishing thing, how many of those kids had never actually left their home. Oh, well, you know, America was such a different place. Understand, you know, this is amazing. You know, we did not have an interstate highway system. The 10 hadn't been built. Hadn't been built until Eisenhower was president of the United States. So just getting across the country was a formidable, formidable task. Yeah. And so no wonder that, you know, if you lived in Pennsylvania, maybe you, maybe you went into Pittsburgh, you know, once or twice. But chances are you just lived right around, you know, whatever, whatever town you were in, Ashtabula or, uh, you know, Steubenville, Ohio. Sure. You just didn't get it. You, you get all that. And then next thing you know, you're with 3,000 other guys on the Queen Mary. And yeah, and you hear Europe, and you're going, yeah, this shouldn't be too bad. Yeah, this should be kind of fun. <laughs> Uh-oh. Continental. Cut two. Yeah. Uh, I, can't, I can't get past it. And I always think about, look, you, you know, what kind of a knucklehead were you at 19? Ridiculous. I was stupid. Truly ridiculous. I was literally a cluck. Yeah. Uh, I, I was a moron. Yeah. And uh, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't even read the New York Times when I was 19 because it was too confusing. Yeah, and back then, by the way, at 19, you never said these words. You know, I think... No. No, no, never yeah, no you never thought. No. You know, and, and no one the, wanted to hear it. And these were guys who were saying, what? Oh, I'm going to go join the army, and I'll go. I'll do whatever they want me to do. Uh, that's that that I, that gets me, man. That, yeah. that that spirit. And I also think too, like you're you're 19 years old, and you're in France, right? Sure. All right, you're just a 19 year old guy. You run around France, and you hear like, oh, listen, um, the evil dictators are at the river, and they're going to take over this town right now. You either stay, or you run down to the beach, get on a boat, and sail across the English Channel to some other country and plan on how to come back and throw these guys out. There were 19-year-old guys who did that, and that, that's, that's just an astounding thing. That, uh, Staggering. Uh, it, it is. Yeah. It, I read it for pleasure as well as for financial gain. <laughs> when we decide to try, to try to make a TV show about it. Yeah, for me, just going to pick up the dry cleaning is a bitch. Tough, man. Are you kidding with this construction? <laughs> Have you seen Robertson <laughs> getting here? <laughs> I was, I was confounded, and I have the GPS that was telling me how to get here. Let me, uh, before we do the, uh, the uh, mid-show uh, ads, uh, I want to ask, after the amazing experience with uh, Vincent Dowling and, and, and the, the start of it all, why it took so long to get you on the boards at Broadway uh, <laughs> with Lucky Man Nora Ephron's this, this past uh, what was it, April, May? I, uh, the great thing about the Great Lake Shakespeare Fest, Vincent Dowling said to all of us who were interns, he says, for the most part, I, I cannot pay you any money. I don't have it. <laughs> but I can give you something more precious than a paycheck, and that is professional experience working in the theater with professional actors. <laughs> um, and he was absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, because most of the actors were from New York. Mm. There, was, there was a contingent from Minneapolis, a big contingent from uh, Kansas City, where, where Vincent had worked. And a bunch of us came out from California, but we were all interns. And, uh, but the, the, the lion's share of them were, were guys from New York. <clears throat> Many of them were gay. Sure. Uh, who just said, "Look, if you want to be a professional actor, there's only one place for you to be. If you're going to do, if you're going to do Shakespeare for a living, you have to come to New York, where you can audition for something that might give you a paycheck three or four times a week. You can't audition for something three or four times a week in Minneapolis, or and there's no reason to go to Los Angeles because you'll just disappear. Right. Um, and uh, uh, two years uh, the, after the end of the second year that I was there, because uh, my son was born in between the, my, my, my son Colin was born, so I went back and uh, uh, had that fabulous thing happen, and, sure. and, and then you had to move on. Uh, and uh, they were right. Uh, and if, they, if those wonderful people hadn't like taken me under their wing and said, here's how, you have a card in your wallet that says you're a professional actor now, so here's what you have to do. And I end up moving to New York. And the reason I did not do any plays on Broadway is because no one would hire me to do plays on Broadway. It was just, yeah. There was just nothing happening. Well, I understand that then, but the chasm between then and... Oh, and well, after that, I was in my childbearing years, to tell you the truth. Yeah. I, I had kids, and to go off and say, Daddy loves you, but I'm going to go off and do a play 
for eight months or however long it, does, it worked. It, 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 I, I couldn't have done it. And, and your youngest now is 17. 17. 18, so, so they're all out the house. So that had that contributed to more to it than anything else. There wasn't this dying need along the way. Oh, there's always the dying desire in yeah. order to do it. A, a need is uh, let's not get you know. <laughs> you know that, I don't trust anybody. That says I must do this. <laughs> well, if you do it, then you know pursue it and get it done. I must do it. <laughs> if you have the opportunity, pursue. And right. the, when the time came, Nora was alive. And she wrote this thing that I had never seen anything like it before. Mm -hmm. And we were going to work it and develop it. And uh, the director, um, George, uh, uh, George Wolf, George G. Wolf, um, I, I had seen a bunch of stuff that he had done. I just thought he was some brand of theatrical, you know, madman genius, which in fact he is. Mm -hmm. And then we had Peter Scolari. Oh, well, yeah, Peter, I, I, I you know, I've, I've had Peter in almost everything. You, you cannot go through something like Peter and I did on Bosom Buddies, right. in which I swear to God, we had, I, I can't tell you how many deep, philosophical, profound, heart-to-heart -heart talks we had about ourselves as, as men and our, our, our stature in the industry and our just place in the zeitgeist in which we're leaning in each other's doorway and I'm wearing pantyhose and I have, I have the orange lipstick on and I'm wearing a wig that makes me look like Stockard Channing's big sister. <laughs> and we're just like, laying, I tell you, man, it's just like a thing. I just try to get back to the purity of what, you know, it's like that. So we, uh, we, 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 we come round and round on each other all the time. Yeah, so when, you, when you're and Peter in rehearsal, though, are, are you, is it falling back into step in terms of the live, in front of an audience because I just uh, did a week on a show with Alice and Janney and Anna Ferris, their show on CBS there. That live in front of the audience oh, thing, that something? rehearsal week, that building up to, it, it, having done every aspect of show business now, do you think maybe that still might be the greatest job in show business? It's the, only time he, it's the only time the actor is in charge. That's the way I look at it. It's the only time the actor gets to, wow. to, to, to um, Control the tempo of everything that's going on. Right. Uh, I've heard that I'm, I didn't write this, but I've heard you know, like television is a writer's medium because the writer writes the arcs of all the characters and has to keep pumping it out. Film is the director's medium. The director makes all of the tiny, minute decisions from the get-go. But the theater, once the show is up, you know, the live audience, then the actors are in charge of everything, and they. <laughs> and we went to town a couple of times on a few things just to see where it would, just where it would go. And lucky guy. Did you? Oh yeah, yeah. Just you know, just to you know, and suddenly you find yourself it's pumped up and you don't know why, and or it's you're hearing something for the first time. There's no better life, for now. and that's why I come back again. You know, the directing thing. Instinctively, I'm an actor. I, I it, it, everything else is like kind of like a learned. Right. A chore or a, a, a craft that you have to, you know, go through an apprenticeship for. Right. Uh, sit there and come to. Was this what show was this? When is it on? Yours with Alice and Janney. Is that the? It's the, called Mom. Mom. Yeah. I thought it was called Oh Mom. Oh Mom. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those. Chuck Lorre. Oh Mom. Oh the. Two and a Half Men. Mike and Molly. Big Bang Theory. And now Mom. I believe he's known as Chuck Kaching Lorre because. <laughs> He's, uh, he's CBS's money in the bank, ain't he? And Warner Brothers. Well, what else does he do? Is that it? Just those four shows. Well, just the mere four. <laughs> but he doesn't do, does he do Big Bang Theory? Is that's that what I'm it? saying. Big Bang oh. Theory, Mike and Molly. Mike two and, and Molly's very funny. Two and a half men. All right, that's uh, a juggernaut. A, a nine year that's the gift that keeps on giving. And now Mom. Yeah, but Big Bang Theory turns out to be the single most successful Were you sitcom a, in history. Really? Yeah, worldwide. Yeah. Get out. I'm not kidding. Did you ever do, like, sitcom? Did you ever do series television? I had a couple of wildly failed pilots, so I well, got to experience that a little which, bit. Which counts not. Sure. Um, I joined the Writers Guild in 1980, 25 years ago, because I was sixth lead on a Barry Kemp. Remember him from uh, Coach? He, he, yes. He did yeah, Coach. Yeah, Barry he Kemp. did a thing with Paul Dooley and uh, Alan Young and Glynis Johns. Wow. Uh, Short-lived, like six, eight episodes and gone. And then I did a uh, very, very fantastically failed uh, four episode and gone. So really, no, I have not had, and I was there one week and I said, this, this is, is the fantastic. job, I've yeah. done it all. Could you, could they write you again? They're, could you do an arc? Could I'm, you get back I'm at least the, six episodes rating? right now. Beautiful, <laughs> That's what I said. Baby. I said, you know what, tell Scorsese says we've done it already. Good gig. I want this. Good gig. Um, but the life of it. Uh, quite honestly, pretty spectacular. Well, there is that thing to, to show business outsiders. The best gig is that 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 That's the casual. best lifestyle is the is the half hour multi camera comedy. Uh, yeah, because you rehearse, you write it, you rehearse, and then you shoot it two days, one day, one day, yeah, you shoot, one yeah. day pre shoot, you one day pre shoot, camera block. Yeah. When we did Bosom Buddies, 
Peter and I. Sure. They were saving money by sticking us on video. Oh boy. Like the most, like almost like the electronic, Dumont electronic. I remember. It was an ancient technology and it looked horrible. I, I, somebody said, did we get this, did we get this stuff from the Soviet Union? Did they get rid of some of their cameras? <laughs> we had fun with the, the guys who, uh, who were the camera operators, but every other show on the Paramount lot was filmed. And they had this schedule on Thursday, they just second team did most of their work. But our Thursdays are camera blockings. We were in front of the cameras the entire day. Okay, yeah. Just over and oh, uh, hold please, hold please. That's yeah. all we heard all yeah. day long. All right, can you take it back to sunny, 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 sunny? All right. And go <laughs> sunny, 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 sunny. Kip, you know that I was, well, you know what, Kip, uh, hey, Buffy, blah, 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 blah. Hold please, hold please, hold please. Uh, Charlie's in the trees Tom, over here. <laughs> Tom, can you wait for the tally light on camera three before you say that? That? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but what we so it was that we ended up putting in like 14-hour days on Thursdays. But because we were doing the scenes over and over again, we started goofing around. Sure. And that's honestly for I think I could speak for all the castes. That's when a lot of really magical stuff got that you got, then used. We on just show got day. bored, started goofing around. We incorporated it into the show. Yeah. You know? As opposed to you go down to Happy Days or Taxi, Laverne and Shirley, and they'd have second team, you know, stand-ins with placards, strings signs that would say Potsy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's and right. then he would move from that mark and then and ready and reset and the guy said Potsy would walk over to the other thing. I said, well, I want this gig, man. Yeah. I don't think you even have to show up on Thursday. That's right, Tom. You want the stand-in. Well, no, I wanted a, I wanted <laughs> wanted a show to, to be on film. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's what I want. Stop with the kicking. Oh, see? Now, this is the first time I was aware of the great uh, Kevin Pollack. We, uh, we were at one of those like backyard events in Hollywood That's that, right. were, that was going to promote understanding and, uh, and goodness and niceness. Right. Uh, and you got up and did a, 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 a what was probably going to be a seven-minute routine that went on into easily triple digits. Sure. I think it went a long time. <laughs> but one of them You're was saying too long. No, no, no. I was dying. I thought it was Matt. You were saving us from the speeches about you know heartfelt you sure. know fundraising or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But your your routine stop with the kicking was uh, I, I we still say it around the house. Do you really stop with the kicking? <laughs> well, it was celebrating the Jewish action star. Right, the Jewish action. Star. <laughs> yeah, which never made sense <laughs> to me. No, no. Why he had that name, Jeff Speakman. Yeah, because that's what you get in central casting. Send over Jeff Speakman! <laughs> Starring in the motion picture film. Stop with the kicking. Stop with the kicking. Stop with the kicking. Um, all right, we're going to segue I did nicely. not finish these beers. No, no, I just, no, please. I just put them. Take your It's time. Sunday and it I got to drive home. You were going for the bit. I was going for the cookie net. Yeah, you, you committed to the bit. That's right. All right, now, we're going to segue nice, nicely. Uh, cue the red epic with a nice little... Uh, uh, the Red Pro 5.0. Yeah. Uh, I do want to know this, because through the dossier, I did not see an answer to this question. Who was the first person you remember that made you laugh, uh, family or friend, but not from TV or show business at all, just someone from real life? It was my brother, Larry. Really? <clears throat> my brother, Larry, who was two and a half years older, than, three and a half years older than I, right. um, who had the driest sense of humor on the planet Earth. He, the guy just killed me. Just, and even now, when we're all together, the family's all together, right. it's, like, it's like, when's Larry coming? You know? uh, wait, wait, oh, let's all drive together. Larry, which car are you going to go in? Everybody wants to ride with my brother, Larry. And was it that kind of sense of humor that just kind of owned you like that oh was oh i absolutely he 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 did a couple of things to me when i was young uh-huh he came to me in my brig but i was i'm little i'm like four maybe and he says hey tom do you want to play follow the leader and i thought my brother wants to play with me this is the greatest thing was, sure sure larry yeah i'll play let's play follow the leader okay i'll be the leader and you follow so he led me all around our backyard and it went on for like 15 minutes and i'm just this is great because we're making faces stuff like that until i finally stepped in the coffee can of muddy water that he had planted that he was always walking me over he led me over it like nine times before I finally stepped in it. And first I cried because I thought it was too cruel, but three minutes later I thought, my brother's a genius. That's the funniest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> the, 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 he, he, he cried me. And another time he was, we were, uh, my, my dad was divorced and we were essentially three feral kids sure. living in an apartment, you know? Uh, and the dad was never home, and we had to do those chores ourselves, and he was washing the breakfast dishes one day, and he said, hey, hey Tom, finish your grapefruit. 
and because uh, we would slice up grapefruit and put sugar all over it. And I, I had, hadn't finished it. I said, okay, I, I should finish it. And I, and I took, a, took a bite of a wedge, and it tasted like uh, dishwashing detergent. Weird. Weird. And I said, oh, man. And three bites into it, <laughs> I realized Larry had sprayed sure. dishwashing liquid into my, into my uh, grapefruit. And I laughed because it's funny, and then realized how stupid I was. Because wouldn't you stop after just one bite? No, my brother was always able to get me to just, you know, some over a, over a peak. Funniest, funniest man on the planet. That was an odd wedge of grapefruit, yeah. you thought. What he, you th but he was the one that made me laugh like crazy. Yeah. Um, and then who was it uh, from either radio or uh, albums or television from the professional world of comedy that sort of caught your eye initially? Do you remember anyone from the... Uh, pros. Well, you know, you could be over at somebody's house and they'd play like Chicken Heart, you know, the, uh, Bill, the Cosby. Bill Cosby thing. I didn't even know such thing as comedy records existed. Yeah. But uh, they'd say, hey, you want to hear Chicken Heart? <laughs> what is that? And they'd put it on. I'd be, yeah. it'd be, I'd be like hypnotized. And yeah. you could go back over it and listen to it again and again and again. Yeah. Then uh, later on, George Carlin on the Flip Wilson show. How about that? Yeah. That was that was that was uh, that was amazing. I remember seeing um, Richard Pryor on an Ed Sullivan show. Yep. In which the routine was about the toughest kid in school, and for no reason at all, the toughest kid in school would like point at say, "You, after school, I'm going to bite your foot off." <laughs> And you'd have to believe him because he'd be walking around with the big shoe hanging out of his mouth. I mean, that was his routine for the for the for Ed Sullivan, for Ed Sullivan show. Yeah. The actual routine sure. was you, after school, I'm going to bite your dick off. <laughs> and you had to believe him because he walked around with a dick hanging. I mean, you know, it was it was pretty fun when you realize that. So that I, I, I was just in awe. I wasn't like a guy who tried to practice. Well, you know who was who was fantastic? John Biner. Yeah. John Biner. He was a guy. John uh, Wayne. John. He would do the Im impressions. He was like mad kinetic kind of kind of energy. Yeah. But later on, um, who was the guy that did the Nixon? Um, David Fry. David Fry. He Best. had the great uh, Nixon comedy album. That was that was pretty great. Yeah. Uh, well, there was Vaughn made it with the Kennedy album before him, which we we would have been really young for that. I remember that. My yeah. dad thought that was hilarious. It was. I, I remember being a kid wondering if it was legal. Can you actually to do mock that? The to mock the president and have people that sort of looked like the president on the cover of the president? Now that's an interesting story, hey. Ron Meter. Yeah, you know the you know the the, the great story about uh, Lenny. Um, well Lenny Bruce. Yeah, man, Von Meter is fucked. Right? His yeah. opening line yeah. at Carnegie yeah. Hall. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing that you remember that. How do you know that? Well, I was fascinated with Von Meter's story for a while. We were trying to develop it into a possible thing. I don't know if it would have been a movie or a, a, a maybe one a, a play or something like that. Right. Because I, I read an interview of him. He was now going by his middle name, something Abbott Meter. His real name was Von Abbott Meter. And after all of that, he just said, "Let's not let's let's make Von Meter go away. I'm now Abbott Meter." That was smart. And he essentially ended his life playing piano for people in in, uh, in Maine, in a small town in Maine. And an interview, he said, "You don't. You have to understand about that. It was exactly one year of the hottest fame you could imagine. Utterly. And it did not peter out. It disappeared overnight. Right." Um, he was in a. He, he had done. The, he had. He had done a like. He was like one of those kind of like hungry eye kind of comics. You know, he had a, a bit of a, a, a company, and they do kind of like routines, mildly amusing. But when he did this three-minute Kennedy impersona impersonation, it just took off. It was like, please do that. And as an artist, he didn't want to just be known for one thing. But then he eventually said, all right, all right, we'll develop this and we'll do more because that's all the people want. And they recorded this, this comedy album, which was the biggest success of all comedy albums up to that point. First Family. I mean, if my dad yeah. went out and bought a comedy record, Everyone. the First Family, everybody had it and everybody listened to it. And uh, it became, it was a monster success, huge, big, and he, he was a guy that was just, he was booked everywhere and he was performing constantly. And they wanted a second one. And so he didn't want to do a sequel. Mm. But he did a second comedy album, and it sold half as well, which was still a monster success. And even one of the last comedy bits is, now I'll never have to do another, you know, JFK. No, so that was it. And uh, he was in a, he, was, he flew to Detroit to do a big gig. And uh, the taxi driver said to him, 
did you hear about Kennedy? And he said, uh, no, how does it go? That's what he said. Wow. Thinking he was going to get, because sure. people treated him like he was John F. Kennedy. Right. And the phone, the, the gig was canceled and the phone stopped ringing. It was exactly one year of everything you'd want. Women, parties, money, attention, fame, access, all that. And then it was gone. Yeah. That, don't you get, when you hear that, Kevin Pollack, yes. Tom, don't, don't you think a little bit, like, if it could happen to him, it could, well, that, could, that could happen to anybody. You say it was over that, one night? That could, one year, huh? But, well, I've had a couple now. <laughs> I wonder if I'm due, am I due? What have I done? They'll, take, they'll always come back to that one podcast you did with the Kevin Pollack chat show. It was all over after that Kevin Pollack chat show. You did the prior dick in the mouth uh, thing uh, and that was so it. That was it, that was it. <laughs> How dare he? Um, speaking of which, what is the fourth thing about you you'd rather no one know? What are the prior three? The, the fourth thing is what we're after. Oh, I want to save you from the first three. No one needs to know, though. Because they're, 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 they're such common I'm things gonna, I'm going to protect you from the first three. No one needs to know those. Oh. I want to know the Now, this is one of these things <laughs> that I'm going to tell you right now that is the problem of doing any sort of like, yes. let's call this press. It's not really press. This is <laughs> because, you know, press needs a mass audience. I, I understand that 8 billion people can get the Internet, but I'm not sure they all search. search they won't all search, see this. They won't all search no, this out. They won't all see Unless this. Unless I really do something stupid. Which and I won't let you. Know, well, no, no, no. Put it all on. Um, so if you say something, it will sound as though I've thought about it. And so it, would be, it all comes off like as a proclamation. That's exactly right. Uh, That's exactly uh, right. Uh, so I, I, the fourth thing I yeah. would not, that I don't want anybody to know uh -huh. about me, I, yeah. give me a couple of moments. Sure, I'll, sure. I'll come up with okay. something. Can I say the thing that I've learned how to say now yes. doing this? Which is, I don't accept the premise of the question. Oh. This is something that you can pull out of your pocket any time you want to. Wow. And the fourth estate has to accept it. Really? Yes. You can say, well, look. That's a hypothetical situation. I don't deal in hypotheticals. They can still come back and say, yes, but if you didn't believe in hypotheticals. <laughs> in which case, you still sort of have to answer the question. But if you say straight up, I do not accept the premise of the question, they can't come back at you. With <laughs> Where did you get this? I, I learned it from a journalist friend of mine. Wow. Uh, who, uh, who was, you know, is there any way I can get out of something? Yeah, just say you don't accept the premise of the question. Send that friend $1,000. I'm going to send him. So I'm still thinking about what the fourth thing. <laughs> No, that's fine. Because everything about, uh, look, I'm pretty obvious, man. I, you're not, you're not, you don't, I don't, Painfully. Uh, I, I look stupid in a hat, which is why, <laughs> like, I'm the only one at this table. <laughs> oh, I'm right back I'm sorry, at Dana Carvey's dressing room. I was room. doing a buffering face there. <laughs> buffering face. Oh, uh, come on, oh, people. No, no, come on, I love that. Um, all right, give me, if you will, that first time on stage where you did something, it got a laugh. Oh, yeah. In specifics, a laugh, not a moment that was powerful uh, necessarily. But you know, this is interesting. This is a very important show business lesson, and this is why I always come, look, all I am is an instinctive actor. I don't know how to do anything else. All right, this is another story about repetition and learning by doing. We, 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 we did Twelfth Night. In, in high school. I was playing Andrew Agu Cheek in that, not Fabian. Fabian is a bad role. I, he might have even been cut from my, Anyway, I was playing Agu Agu Cheek, Andrew Agu Cheek. And we had done it like most high schools, you know, do it. What, oh, I tell you, we all sounded like that, except John Gilkerson, who was a great actor. Um, uh, uh, and we, one day we were told by our drama teacher that we were going to perform scenes at every uh, uh, assembly for the day. So we performed these scenes three times in a uh, six times in one day. Wow. We didn't have to go to class, we just had to perform these, these scenes from Shakespeare for about 300 people at a time. 300 of our friends and or enemies or the people that we you know hoped we wouldn't see at school when we would show up because they were evil. Um, but and so about third assembly, well we started cutting up. And by the time we got to the sixth one, I had five or six gags as Sir Andrew Agerchik that were absolute killer. And when, you know, when somebody laughs at Shakespeare in high school, you're done, man. You're just, 
you're, you're just settled. That's, that's all you want to do from then on. Yeah. I was, I was a worthless student anyway, but that made me even more so. It's crazy powerful, isn't it? That yeah, laugh, yeah. That I, did, I think I just did a silly dance, you know. I said something about and bear baiting and then did a different <coughs> dance. And that was it, man. They laughed at the they laughed at the silly dance. Yeah, I mean, cut to this silly dance. <laughs> the lot of the <laughs> why does it always end up in Dana Carvey's dressing room? Excuse me, I'm going to have a sip of my bitter juice. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone has a right to be bitter, um, uh, well, you know, there were a lot of things I'm talking to uh, performers of comedy uh, in front of a live audience about is getting to the point, specifically monologists, getting to the point where but it's true of an actor uh, on stage, where you hear the silence of the audience and you lean into it because mm. you know they're actually listening. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to the early training, which is don't let there be silence. The magic of that silence som sometimes creates a sense of power. Um, do you have any recollection of, of that, of realizing there was silence for good? Uh, like in the play you just did, for example. Yeah, well, there was that. There was um, uh, actually, I, I did a play at, at, at the Great Lake Shakespeare Festival. Well, look, you understand that I was just a guy who was loud and funny. Sure. And then I did three years of classical repertory, and I came out of that, and I and I was an actor, and that you know I got the job because I was loud and funny, but then I was literally disciplined and and uh, uh, by the experience of working with those professionals. Um, and we, I, I did a, I was in a performance of Juno and the Paycock by Sean O'Casey, and I played a role called Jerry Devine, which is, only has two little tiny scenes. And most of the time, I think a lot, in a lot of productions he might be cut, or he comes in so, so fast. And in the, the second time he shows up, he breaks the heart of a girl, uh, of, of, uh, of Juno's uh, um, uh, uh, daughter. And um, it, was, it was a great, it was a magnificent production of it. And I was on stage with more silences than I had lines, and it was powerful. And that was probably the first time that I, I'm, I'm actively remembering there being a silence in which everybody was leaning, leaning forward. In. And part of it, the power of it was the, the words and the play. Uh, but there was some other thing about the way I was directed and, and some aspect of, of, of being in the moment there that, that I remember as being like, it shouldn't be that good, you know? Right. I, and and that, was, you know, that was one of the, the building blocks of figuring out how to do it for a living. It is one of those weird things where as powerful as that first laugh was and a drug that lasts a lifetime, the maturity of appreciating the silence is this whole other... But no, so, so how did you go from being, you know, stopped with the kicking Stand to, to, to a, a guy that, you know, can carry weight extremely dramatically? And I mean, in some of the work that you've done even at Playtone, I mean, in, in, uh, in From the Earth to the Moon as well. Right. Joe Shea. Yeah. It's not the same thing. No. Dear, dear Joe Shea. Delightful. Uh, what a man. S sacrifice himself, Joe Shea did. Yeah. How do you do that? Uh, a couple, I'm asking you. A couple hundred auditions. Yeah. Where they, it felt like they weren't just saying no. They were saying, "How about anyone but you was going to get this?" But but there's this other thing too. You Barry Levinson, to be to be totally honest, Barry loved stand-ups, was a stand-up. Yeah, yeah. Him and Craig T. Nelson. Which were, they were partners with Craig T. Nelson. Yeah. And so he put it to stand-up in every one of his movies. If you go back and look at them, even Dennis Miller and um, Disclosure, I think it was. You got and well, Diner, Diner. They had you know tons of them. Yeah. But every one. So. You know, I, but did he or other directors say, stop talking? Your job is not to make up lines. This is yes. something that happens, is that yeah. so much of the great comedies that are being made right now is they, they literally come in and they improvise and they build the scenes even right there. But to be the actor, you, you don't get to do that. It's about listening. You don't get to make stuff up. Right. You know, look, you don't get to make stuff up in this one, all right? Yeah. So you got to listen. And uh, Yeah, no, it was about nailing the scene exactly as it was written. And then the screen test. It was the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the ticket to the bigs. So you did, you did Avalon, Avalon. And you did... Uh, and then a couple of years later, A Few Good Men, and then Usual Suspects. Oh, my Casino. God. A Few Good Men. It's sure, over. yes. Yeah, you and Kevin Bacon. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Me yeah, and Kevin no, no, Bacon. No, 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 no. I mean, that was, that was an impressive movie. <laughs> Well, yeah, and you were yeah. That's right. You were you were Aaron serious, Sorkin, serious lawyer there. Yeah, yeah. Jack, Mr. Nicholson. What was that like? Spectacular. Yeah, yeah. It must yeah. have been. Yeah, also goofy. Did, I did, did I you did. forgive me? I don't remember. Did you fly down to Guantanamo Bay with we everybody? We asked to, and then the Marines read the script and said, "Wait a minute." But you, your character flew down in to the London. film. We went so you wore those white shoes. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> we, we wore the whites. We wore the whites. 
<laughs> there is, there is something. No, no, look, you know, because I, you know, I live and die by costumes and stuff like that. There is something about a recognizable actor wearing navy whites. It's a little on the goofy side. <laughs> the rest of the navy uniforms look cool. They do. I mean, they do. You know, the dark yeah, blues and all buttons, that kind of yeah. stuff. But when you put on the navy whites, look at look at look at, look at Kevin Pollock wearing those navy whites. Come on. That, that, that's <laughs> How about a look at that. Tom Cruise wearing the navy? Well, now you got okay. You know, you can understand that. But yeah, he's not Jewish. Yeah, yeah. There's just something about it. <laughs> yeah. So, but though, Sarah, there you are. But do you think that being a stand-up comedian, because not all not all comedians can do that. Most can't. Can't make the makes yeah. the can't stop themselves from being because stand up comedy. Stop them. Do you not agree, sir? <laughs> um, they can't, can't stop. stop themselves from talking. They right. can't allow themselves the the silences right. that that yeah. can get in the way. I think it was because I did impersonations and I was fascinated by building the character and the voice, not just the voice, but the physicality. Helped me to study acting without studying it uh, with a class. But more importantly, I think. A comedians are not trained to listen, they're trained to talk. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then acting is just listening yeah. and reacting. Yeah. So I don't know where the hell that came from. When comedians are silent, that means they're pacing the stage, <laughs> breathing into the microphone. <sighs> <laughs> what else? What else? So, what else? Yeah. Uh, well, no, what but else? Wow, Bin Laden. <laughs> <laughs> but now, what, you obviously studied stand-up for Punchline. Yes, I did. And yeah. so you went to the dark recesses. Oh, my God. That was petrifying. Why? Well, because uh, it's one of the smart things I did. Barry Sobel was, uh, and uh, an uh, and old pal of mine, Randy Fector, were, they, we, we sort of like began to build an act. Um, and David Selter, who wrote the screenplay, he just wrote kind of like jokey chuffa in the screenplay that was not the act. I mean, it wasn't funny. And it didn't have any cohesiveness to it. So we had to like, kind of like build an act. And I had no stand-up com. I wasn't a guy that went down to open mic nights or anything like that. Uh, but I had to start doing that before we had an act. Sure. I had to start. I went, there was one time I couldn't get on <laughs> at, the, uh, at the comedy store. Of course not. Because Mitzi said, he's not funny. <laughs> because, I did, because I didn't have an act yet. So that was tough going on for three minutes and the, 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 the being as petrified as one was, thinking that, no, I got, some, I got some material here. And all of a sudden, 17 seconds in, you've said all the material. Yeah. And you, there's no way for you to get off. But eventually, we got some stuff and it worked out. And I was able to get into the rhythm of, I had, I had enough stuff that was cohesive and worked, and then I could, I could riff off of. If if the audience uh, was there, and I I ended up doing some things at Catch a Rising Star in New York. Um, but uh, how did that NYU. feel? How did that feel? Oh, it, it, I'm sorry. When you finally had crack cocaine. Yeah. Rock crack rock cocaine crack cocaine. Because rock, big rock big rock cocaine. Because um, when you're alone and you're solo up there, and you can modulate them and you get the laughs and you can build on it, you can go back and forth, and you can the power of like uh, calling back something and having them. It's like you're, you're, you're the one-man show, and it, you, the adrenaline and blood shoots through your head in a way that I think is identical to, uh, to uh, crystal meth. Yeah. That's, why, that's why so many comedians are just shambles, you know, off stage, which we sort of explored in that movie a little bit, um, uh, in Punchline. Yeah. The fact that he was a miserable human being. But well, actual endorphin is released, like a runner's It is that, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and the sense of... Uh, I would do gigs. I would do a shot at 12.30, and at 4 o'clock in the morning, I still can't figure out why I'm not asleep, because <laughs> it had just shot, through, you know, the adrenaline shoots through you in a way that was just undeniable. Yeah, unlike something you hadn't felt as an actor, I'm sure. No, no, no. Yeah. Well, uh, Because it's, it's that high wire act of living and dying on your own wits moment by moment. Well, the freedom of being, you know, doing it all yourself. I, I had, you know, at the Great Lake Shakespeare Fair and a couple of other places, but, you know, I, in college and whatnot, it was, it was the performing uh, gave that same certain type of high, but it was, all, it was part of an ensemble. You know, you all went out together and had pancakes, at, you know, at, the, at Lions on Howe in Sacramento. Uh, but when it's you and you alone, oh my God, your head bursts. And I, I can't remember what I said. You know, once you, when you come off stage, what do you? You know, you're in a fog. You're yeah. In a, you're, you feel like you're, you know, 27 feet tall, and you're still, you're still stretching. Yeah. No, I, I, I pity some, uh, some, uh, some comedians. Well, you have to find a way to digest it afterwards. It eventually becomes part of it. Was it self-destructive for you at some point? No, 
because I, I not that uh, it's all self destructive no, no, I don't want to be like it is that, a percentage. But. It's a very high percentage, which is why the documentary is being made, uh, and it and begs the question: Do you think you have to be miserable to be funny? There was something you might probably know this more than I do. I saw something that had a collection of a lot of the comedians that were all over the place at the time that I was doing that, mm -hmm. uh, preparing punchline, and these guys were just sensational, man. They were just great, and. You know, 20, 20 years after the fact, they, you know, they were, <laughs> they were kind of, you know, the, 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 the business, the, there's no longer comedy clubs in every, every city and they don't have, you know, you can't go to the Chuckle Hut in, to, in Topeka and stay in the condo with the other comedians and stuff like that. Yeah. Tough, tough gig. Yeah, you can't make a living as an unknown the way you could in that particular moment in time during the gold rush really? of stand-up. When was that? What years late was 80s, it? Late 80s. Late 80s. Was For how long did it last about? Uh, 87 to 91. Do you think cable television killed it? I because think, it robbed everybody of their material. For to them. be honest with you, it's the same thing that killed um, vaudeville, which is inventory problem. Here it is. You've got Evening at the Improv and yeah. four other shows on television right. at the time featuring five comedians. And you'd sit home and you'd watch. Well, that, that's five comedians on this show and then four others. So that's 25 comedians with five minutes mm -hmm. times 13 episodes. There aren't that many comedians with five television ready five oh, minutes. I see. So eventually, during the season of these shows, you'd sit home and watch comedian on TV any given night and think, this guy's not terribly funny. But before that happened, these comedy clubs exploded from 50 to 300 yeah. around the country, as you said. So suddenly, you've got 300 headliners needed to fill these clubs around the country. Excuse me. Well, the year before, there was only 50 headliners yeah. needed. Well, there wasn't 300 headliners. Did you ever go on the road and do some stuff and people say, oh, we heard you say that on TV? That's your TV act? Absolutely. Was there not just a need that you couldn't, like, do the stuff that killed on, you know, whatever the hit shows you it were It happened to other guys more than me, I think because of the impersonations I was able to, yeah. to, to change it a little bit. You can bit. always rip that. Yeah. Rip that. But... You, you had 300 comedy clubs, 300 headliners doing an hour. So suddenly middle acts were moved up prematurely to mm -hmm. be headliners. Opening acts were moved up prematurely to do the middle 20 minutes. And guys who the week before were saying, do you want fries with that, were suddenly MCs in comedy clubs. Yeah, I mean, I, I seem to remember, you'd go to like a place like Ho 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 uh, in where I'm Stockton, California. That's and right. Just picking something, something. Sure. <laughs> and there would, be three com there would be three comedians. There'd right. be a first one and a second one and a third. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And they do what, two shows? They do two shows on the weekend. So in vaudeville in the 20s, it happened there where the scene exploded and the too many venues opened up and there weren't enough qualified performers. Mm. And that's, in fact, what killed stand-up by the early 90s, which fortunately for me is when A Few Good Men happened. There you go. And I went from auditioning to, to offers and there we went. How about that moment for you when you went from auditioning to, to offers? Because that really, you know... There are moments in time that change everything. That's uh, a goal line. Well, Bosom Buddies got canceled after two seasons, and uh, I, I signed a, a development deal with CBS to come up with some other television series that never came to pass. I, you know, just I don't know why. Um, uh, and uh, like a year deal. Yeah, like, you know, a year in order to develop. And I think we actually, with me working with some writers, I think at some point maybe two different, you know, treatments or drafts had been come up. And nothing, they didn't go anywhere. You know, because they were the three networks at the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I was... Yeah. Uh, but uh, two things. Uh, then uh, I got a... I got a call to audition for Splash with Ron Howard. A smaller part, initially. I didn't know what part. I thought I was just going in. I read the screenplay and I said, well, obviously, the only thing, the only stuff I'd come close to reading for was, you know, the sidekick or the brother or the, you know, whatever. Eugene Levy's part, uh, maybe? No, uh, the, the, the brother. I, yeah. thought, I thought I was reading for the brother in, in, in Splash. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, Brian Grazer and Ron Howard were essentially young, unproved Turks. They had made, you know, Ron had made all of his Roger Corman movies. Brian was just beginning to to produce stuff, and they had had um, uh, Michael Ke late shift, Michael Keaton night and shift. night shift. Thank you, uh, uh, Michael Keaton and um, uh, Henry Winkler, mm. uh, Shelley Long. Yeah, and that there was a bona fide movie. Yes. and I had lost out on Police Academy. 
I could not get into police academy, and I thought, well, I, you know, this is, I'm, I'm friggin'. Oh, the Gutenberg part? Uh, no, I, anyway, <laughs> any, come on. You know, this, I, I thought, look, I'm the age, there's got, I think there's like 19 guys in the police academy. I should be able to score some, nothing. Your agent couldn't get you an audition? No, 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 I auditioned, and it was like, thank you. And I was like, oh. I was just, I was just kind of out. So I was a little demoralized. And then, uh, um, uh, this call can go in and meet uh, Ron and Brian, this guy, Ron and Brian. The TV star, Ron Howard. Ron Howard, yeah, who I had never met. I had done an episode of, of Happy, uh, Days. Happy Days in my year of, uh, of not being uh, uh, on, you know, employed. Right. Um, and Lowell Gans and Babalu Mandel, who were the writers of Happy Days, who were like ultra-supervising producers, they had written this screenplay about the mermaid. And they had told Ron, you know, this guy came in, he did one thing, he was pretty funny. Um, so I went off and met guys, and it was the first time I met producer, a producer and a director who were like peers. Usually, at, even then, they, everybody was like at least a generation older than me and kind of like big shots, and you'd have meetings with them at like the Ivy on Robertson or sure. something like that. And I'm dressed like a schlub, and I can't afford to pay for the parking and stuff like that. Uh, but meeting Ron and Brian, I thought, these, these are guys like I went to college with. I mean, Ron was with it. He was Opie Cunningham, so there was a little bit of that. But they were in crappy offices with this bad furniture and ancient, you know, posters of old Yeller and stuff on the, right. and the old Disney. I mean, and I thought that they were incredibly approachable. So uh, we sort of like talked almost like you and I are talking right now about a pragmatic um, you know, overview of you know what's go you know what's going on in the business and what I thought of the thing. And I said, great. And uh, I was just a meeting, and uh, I said, well, you know, I don't know if anything comes about something like that. And I th probably later in that day, I got a I got a call at the at the house that I was wondering if I could afford to keep, you know, uh, out in the valley uh, without a TV show. Um, and I said, okay, we want we want you. Ron was on the phone. He said, I want you to come in, but I don't want you to read for. Uh, the brother, I want you to read for uh, um, the, the the main guy. I said, oh, 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 dear me. Oh, okay. Fine. Oh, jeepers. You know, I said something like that. <laughs> so prepare, then went in and <clears throat> went in and uh, uh, and did it. And did it well. Enough. Ron was rarely rarely happy because he had one of the first. Remember with J J J V C, the the home video thing. He had the little miniature VHS that went into the VHS. Um, you know, component, uh, yeah. component. Like two pieces, and it, out of it, you got like twenty minutes of video. And he was just like, he was, he was just so happy. It was, oh, well, this is gonna be great. So he was videotaping the, uh, the audition, which I think is on one of the, you know, YouTube. Uh, uh, no, I think it's on one of the, uh, probably is, but it's on one of the, uh, the, you know, the, DVDs. the celebration DVDs of it. Yeah, and so I did it, and I just, I believe I just did one audition, on tape. And he called me uh, the next day and said, well, listen, um, listen, you got the job, but I said, oh, geez, you know, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but part in my head, you know, in that nanosecond of, of what goes on, it says, I can't believe you don't get a job. Just that doesn't happen. No, Th there's got to be some other thing that is going to screw this up for me. And he said, oh, you've got OK, you've got the part, but. I really want this actress named Daryl Hannah to play Madison, and the studio is fighting me on this. So I want you to come in, and we're going to do a real camera test with Daryl Hannah that needs to have you in it. So you'll have to, you'll have to prepare like four scenes, and, uh, uh, and it will, we'll do a, you know, it'll be a really serious test. So you'll have to be up on your game. I said, uh, OK. Hey, can, uh, Ron, can I ask you a question? <laughs> yeah, you know what? Is there any way? After this test, are you going to fire me? <laughs> and he said, <laughs> no, no, no. You don't have to worry about a thing. And I did not believe him for an instant. No. Not for an instant. I said, this is a sandbagging opportunity. There, there's someone at the studio is going to see this and they say, I love her. Get rid of him. And Ron will say, you know, you know, Tom, uh, you just didn't really have it in that. It was the back of my head. You can't judge me. <laughs> but it all, it, we, so we did some stuff, and it, it, I think the test is on maybe on one of those DVDs as well. And that's how it happened. And the only reason this happened, and this is like the vagaries of the business, and like when young people say, "Oh, Mr. Hanks," yeah. you know, so just you know, just plug away, man. Just do it any chance you take. Don't take anything too. So just do your best. Um, that came about because, number one, it was a low-budget Disney movie about a mermaid. And this was before 
Eisner and Katzenberg took over. So this was literally the Disney of the Love Bug mm -hmm. and uh, Condor Man and movies, movies like that. Uh, and everybody else who, who was on the list of hireable actors who said no, they turned it down. I mean, everybody. George Siegel and Dudley Moore and everybody who was anybody had, had turned it down. So it was a catch em. It was a pick em. It was like a leftover, you know, a double A league uh, kind, of, kind of game. And uh, those guys were just starting up. Ron and Brian just wanted to, get, wanted to get the movie made. And so they were very well organized. So they, lo and behold. And after that, um, I, I don't think I had to. I, don't, I, I, I probably went in for some other things to, to audition for. But then that goofy thing happens as people start asking you to be in movies. And you say, OK. <laughs> you want me to be in a movie? Sure. Yeah. And I, you know, I said yes to like 96 movies in a row because they asked me. Right. To be in movies. You need to learn a little something on every one, but that was, that was it. Initially, yeah, when you make that transition, it is yes to everything. Yes. And you then, know, how old is he? He's my, he's yours. I'm in. I'm in. Let's go. Let's <laughs> That's do right. It. I know how to do that. Yeah. Uh, and I remember reading uh, th that you said after League of Their Own and that wonderful character, you know what? I don't think I want to play pussies. I'm not going to play pussies anymore. anymore. And now, I don't mean pussies in the... Uh, oh, I know. ...in the bad term. Uh, the, it's not in a pejorative sense. Well, actually it is, but it's not in the nasties. You mean... Guys who have are out of con they don't have any control over their over their destiny. Yeah, why is this happening to me? Yeah, I'm in love with a girl and yet I can't do the thing and because you know remember the era where essentially Bill Murray's early comedies established every other comedy that was written. Yes, they were all kind of like variations of stripes or meatballs or something like that. And there were a million guys that looked like we all looked more or less the same, and we were all hapless heroes in these kind of like, not low budget, but medium budget comedies, and some of them worked really well, and, and by and large, they were kind of like cannon fodder for the distribution machine. And by that time, I was like 36 years old, and I just said, you know, there's, you, you, you make a sort of movie in your 20s and early 30s that you just can't, you, you, gotta, you gotta stop doing. Right. And so I, I sat down with my crack team of show business expert, uh, and he says, so what do you think? I said, you know, I'm 36, and I just, I, I just, I think I got to stop playing pussies. And really, it was about playing men instead of boys. Men who understood uh, bitter compromise. And the next, uh, the next movie that came out of it, uh, I think, was um, uh, well, we started working on Apollo 13. I, you know, not long after that, Apollo 13. And I think I made uh, uh, Sleepless in Seattle uh, after that. And you know, you got to, you got, you got, you got to hit it to the point where you say, all right, all right, you got to. You got to start. You got to learn how to say no, which is a very hard thing to say. It is. It's a very, very hard thing to say. It's so easy to say yes to something. You yeah. know, it's great. They're going to pay you. And every time you say in Thailand, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to get to do. I'm going to hit the trifecta on this. I get to play baseball, shoot a gun, and kiss a girl. I get to do all the three things that you want to do in a movie. Yeah. Um, so yes, yes, I'm. It's hard to say no. You have to say at the end of the day, I, 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 I don't know what to bring to this. And is it true that no matter how, because Jimmy Stewart said this at one point, no matter how uh, quickly the train is moving, how well things are going, and how on top of the world one might feel, when you do say no, there's a part of you that instantly thinks, well, that'll be the last time they ask. Uh, 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 a smart guy in show business who was running one of the agencies at, at some, it's it it Ron Meyer who now runs, he was at CAA at yeah. the time, and uh, uh, there, was some, there was something that was on the, on the table, and I didn't know him well enough in order to have this conversation, but I was down meeting my, my Richard Lovett, who's my crack show business, you know, swami. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I remember, I said, well, Ron, do you think, what do you think of this? He said, well look, well, look, at the end of the day, you gotta ask yourself, you know, if somebody else does it, are you gonna shoot yourself in the head? You know, I said, oh, actually, that's a good way of looking at it, you know. If you say no and somebody else says yes, are you gonna see that? Yeah, I'm gonna see them do it, and so I should have done it, shoot yourself in the head. And, you know, that, that's a good way of looking at it. I, I have yet to, I've seen other people be brilliant and said, I couldn't have done that, but yeah. I, haven't, I haven't felt as though I wanted to shoot myself in the head. Um, Except four years ago when I ran into you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And again, we're right back in Dana Carver's dressing room. You know what? Maybe I've had just a little too much of my good buddy here. I am taking, I just want to say, I'm taking the smallest sips imaginable. I'm taking literally movie sips from this beer. Mm. Mm. 
That's delicious. <laughs> and it's not an advertisement. Don't send me any Pabst Blue Ribbon. What's the most important thing you know? Oh, God. Secret of happiness. Which is? Tell the truth. It's really it's that simple. There's no, it gets you into trouble sometimes. But just, you know, that, who cares, man? This is the way it works. Just tell the truth. Yeah, easiest thing to remember. Well, yeah, yeah, it is, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, you know, I kind of. Yeah, yeah. By the way, I figured that out uh, two and a half years ago. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> that would be 54 and a half years of living in, 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 in self-loathing darkness. So you get past that and things <laughs> seem, seem to be a little bit better, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> and here's the self-loathing darkness. Um, you know what that's like, yes. you know, the self-loathing darkness. We wake up 3 o'clock in the morning and kind of go, but this is old Steve Martin bit where you just kind of like go in, you sprinkle some water in your face, and you look at yourself in the mirror and you say, what is happening to me? <laughs> you know? yeah. Why am I in this hotel? <laughs> yeah. Was, um, so, so now, uh, at this point, what are your weaknesses? Uh, the, the same ones. They, they never, they, do they ever change? I don't think so. I thought that, you know, a degree of procrastination, right. you know, enthusiasm that starts on Monday, that, but just disappears sometime Thursday morning, you know? And it's like, ah, uh, what are you going to do today? I don't know, answer some emails or something. I don't know. <laughs> you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to dodge every responsibility I can. That's right. That, that's, that's it. That, uh, that always comes down to it. You see other people doing stuff, and they're always busy, and you think, you know, I, I wish I was like that. <laughs> <laughs> Daddy loves me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you want to be, and you just can't get there sometimes. You know what it's like. You know, you want to, and you, yeah. just, you just can't. You can't. You can't turn it on. But it's so very human. Uh, Pro procrastination. That's you know, and it goes back. Look, I remember being in high school. You know, is life that different from high school? Have we all? Have you guys all changed show since high school? Is that well, show business is exactly like high school. Martin Mull confirmed that 35 years ago he did say that show business was high school with, with money. money. Yes, that was probably the greatest truism. That and nobody knows anything. Right. William Goldman's thing about show business: nobody knows anything. Yeah. Um, uh, is that even in high school, where I, th you know, you start off the school year and you get the binders and the thing, and you but know exactly how you're going to approach that. Yeah, and it's all just it's all just gone for you know for crap by you know week three. But I promise you, it all, comes you're, all you're doing is going to school for the hang. You know, <laughs> I went to, I went to school for the hang, man. That was it. But I love going. Did you not love going to school? Yes. I ha I went to high school for the hang. For the hang. No, the the everything else was like you know to be dealt with. But. <laughs> The hang was like magnificent, you be know. Dealt with. It's like you know, you'd, 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 uh, you'd, you'd be in a be in a class, and then hey, then in between classes, you know, you just you're just looking for somebody to interact with. Yeah. Just mix it up with, and then you go back into class. Yeah. Not pay attention. Unless the few classes that you like. Yeah, I had one teacher who taught creative writing, and one semester we just learned about Samuel Clemens. Wow. And his writings, and that absolutely tra changed my comedic point of view in the same way that early Bill Cosby album did. I had a brilliant, uh, believe it or not, trigonometry professor. Do tell. Who was, it was the last time I took any math class. His name was Dr. Charrington, and he just made it fun. I don't, I don't know what it was. He just had a way of talking to it. I didn't understand it at all, but he, he was charitable, you know? Yeah. He wasn't one of those guys, hey, stop the buzzing, cousin. You know, he, did, he wasn't one of those kind of math teachers. He was actually a guy. And he, he he was he was just very he was just very fun. And 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 a couple of other teachers that were like just great. But you know, I went to a public school with like two thousand students in it. So same here. Mike, Mike Shimani, history would give you a test, and at the top it would say test instructions, right? And you in the first thing said preheat the oven at three fifty. <laughs> Beautiful. And that kind of effort. There you go. Honestly, that's you, right. Yeah. You're dialed right into that guy. Well, no one would believe that you're... Uh... I had Mr. Farnsworth in drama. That was the big change. That was, I couldn't believe that you, this is a class? You're kidding me. Yeah. This is, I'm sorry, this is what I do in every class. <laughs> Be loud and funny. This is what I do in, in, in composition. This is what I do in typing 50. This is what, this is what I do. Thank this God. is what I do in gym. Thank God we took typing, by the way, not knowing the computer was about to come out. <laughs> it was the easy class. Yeah, yeah, think. yeah, yeah. Uh, well, no one would believe you find time to procrastinate based on all the work that your production company oh, has. Oh, you should come down to the office sometimes. <laughs>
the couple times I have stopped by Playtone, it's... Have you caught me designing stationery? Which I kind of do every now and again. <laughs> if I drew a little typewriter right here and put my name off it and printed that up, take this to Kinko's and give me a thousand copies. I just want to see what it looks like. That's Wednesday. That's what I... That's that, that, and by Thursday, I don't give a... I don't care about that thing anymore. Danny Strong sat here and talked glowingly. Oh, no, Danny Strong. Game change. Yeah, game change, yes. Um, I think everyone knows your involvement in, uh, with uh, your lovely wife, Rita, on My Big Fat Greek Wedding, but also I don't think everyone knows that you were also a production company behind uh, Mamma Mia. And I was surprised to see for Spike Jones Where the Wild Things Are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now I understand there's some times where you really are the lead production house and you make it happen, and other times you're part of it to begin with and really other people make it happen. Uh, we, we, on, on uh, Mamma Mia, uh, Playtone was very much involved in the shooting and, and the post. That was not me. And we, yeah, Rita, and I, actually Rita went and saw the show and just said, this has got to happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, and we called up actually uh, the, 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 the true producers who were running the, the stage show years before the movie was made, because everybody was trying to get them to do it. Right. Everybody wanted to, hey, we want to make a movie. And they were, sit they were sitting on it. And uh, when we talked to them, I just said, look, everybody on the planet wants you to do your show and do a movie, but you don't want to, because you got 19 you know, touring companies out, and you're making a lot of money playing in Jakarta and Stockholm and Tokyo and and uh, you know Adelaide and they were they were just had all these I said but when the time comes you want to make it in a movie do it with us because we'll make it fun and easy for you and we won't boss you around too much and and uh, and that's what happened but Rita was the one, one of the key players in that without a doubt and uh, the other stuff that had like, like Spike Jones from where the wild things are that uh, yeah that came about because it was um, Maurice was still alive Maurice Sendak um, and we started talking on the phone a little bit, and we just, you know, look, this is a hard thing to do. It's hard to take a, a very thin book and turn it into a full-length motion picture, and he loved Spike, and Spike loved him, and they almost did another project. Uh, uh, he, Spike almost did something, I think, Harold and the Purple Crayon by Clerman, another really, really classic children's book. And, but that was all Spike. That, that we were involved because we, were, we had a connection with... Uh, with more rescind it, but that was that was really all spike. So we're guys that come in and help facilitate the making of the movie. Right. Um, but we're not like the creative quality assurance drivers of it. We we you know they write the scripts and they pursue it and they make them. But there's other things where it's the opposite. We are the people that maintain the scripts, govern that, do the quality assurance, pass on it, and and like the HBO things we've done. Uh, even though they've we've been with Steven Spielberg. Stephen and I talk about like the, the grand philosophical aspect of it, and he's invo he sees everything. But it was really Playtone that uh, that does everything from soup to nuts. Yeah, in the case of Band of Brothers and Pacific. Yeah, yeah, and, yes. And Adams. John Adams. Yeah, that was that was that was all Playtone. Yeah. Uh, but we make alliances with people, you know. Kirk uh, Kirk Ellis, who wrote um, uh, John Adams. Uh, he, he wrote every single word. He wrote every episode, and Tom Hooper directed every single one. Sometimes you you can't do that on a on a long form miniseries because time is just of the essence. Never, never on both on both the World War II things, Band of Brothers of the Pacific. We had two units going full time. You know, we had a red and a blue unit. We had different directors, different cinematographers, and they have to go full bore twenty four hours a day because otherwise uh, it, it would cost five hundred million dollars to do, and it would just take too long. Right. But you have actors that are jumping back and forth all the time, which is pretty cool, actually. Yeah, I would think really cool. They all, it all ch I think some of the actors, without a doubt, probably hated the experience. Because? Oh, because all oh, these not headed producers Too and how come I'm work? down here? Nah, 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 nah. And, you know, like they don't call me at the right time. I'm going to say maybe 7% of the actors end up having that kind of experience because it is physically unpleasant. But for the other. I said 7%, other 93%, it changes their lives. Yeah. Man. They go off and have, because they're long gigs. You know, you're off for six months, and you're putting on the same clothes with the same outfit with the same guys. Somebody gets killed and they're gone forever. You know, it, it's an it's a, it's a, it's a emotional arc everybody goes on. And it's as close to an actual operation in the, uh, in the field as a production's going to get on a miniseries. Yeah, show. you feel how hot and miserable it all is. When we were doing, a, 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 I, I said it to both of them because we kind of have a day where everybody's going to start their training. And I just said, look, um, 
you might not have lines on the day you work, but show up ready to work because you're going to be in the background of some shot. And as it lives and people see the episodes more and more, they'll recognize that the guy from episode seven was the guy in the back making a cup of coffee in episode three. So just come to work, have a sandwich in your pocket. You know, you got all these big pockets on your combat pants. Put some juice, have a protein bar, have a sandwich in the back there, and just hang out all day and see what see what you can make out of it. And God bless them, man. They all they always seem to do. We still have they still have reunions for uh, Band of Brothers. The guys still get together. I think once a year when the on the anniversary of them starting boot camp, and uh, I've gone a couple of times. That's pretty spectacular. Yeah, they're, they're great actors. Guys who went off and did you know fantastic stuff. What's his name on Homeland? Yeah, yeah, uh, Damian Lewis. Damian. Yeah, Damian Lewis. Um, now, uh, how does that? Ron Livingston feel when, you know... We feel like geniuses. Well, <laughs> I didn't want to say it. I'm glad you did. <laughs> we feel like geniuses. <laughs> We're not. When we did Band of Brothers, it's like everybody that was just out of or coming out of RADA and Guildhall and Lambda, all of the great drama schools, they were just beginning to like get work on BBC. They're, they all in... They, you, go, you go through... Uh, you go back and look at the cast of Band of Brothers, it's got every, almost every amazing actor that's working today had some kind of like role in it. Um, um, who's the, uh, uh, forgive me, um, he's in 12 Years a Slave. He plays the bad guy at the end of 12 Years a Slave. Uh, um, not Fassbender. Yes, yes, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He's in Band of Brothers. Yeah, actually he was in an episode I directed of Band of Brothers, as a matter of fact. Um, goes on and on. Sammy so, worked with him in the Inglorious Bastards film. That's right. Yeah, there you go. There yeah. you go. Um, in the inglorious, in, in the inglorious, in, glorious, the, in the inglorious bastards film. I have That's to ask right. you. A you little, did the, uh, you did the Tarantino. You I, did that. I did. He I did, did the Tarantino. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was a great movie, by the way. Oh, thanks. Holy smokes! What a. Did you have fun doing that? I had tremendous. Fun. I would Just imagine like it would be a blast. Like boot camp. We went. We were there for months in Berlin. In Berlin, is yeah. that a great town? Oh, Berlin's amazing. a swinging. That's a swinging town. Good joint. You'd like it. <laughs> Eventually, when we do reunion for Avalon, I think it takes place. I just place got in myself in trouble. <laughs> I just got myself in trouble. Damn. That goes on the web. Oh, God. <laughs> okay, listen. I got to ask a couple minutes about Dragnet. Sure, yeah. and then, uh, oh, uh, really? Uh, yes. Bring it on. I'll tell you why. There's a photograph that you need to see. It takes place this last Halloween. We're going to throw it up now. Uh, so that Tom can see it. They're asleep at the wheel. It's not up. There it is. Oh, my God. Wait now, a minute. On the right there, portraying your character, our very own Jamie Foxx. Get out. Yes. I made the costumes myself. She made the costumes for both. You're Corey. me with a hairnet yes. and the thing? Yes. Oh, my God. And I there's Corey. Trivik, undercover is Amal Muzz. Man, oh, man. That's right. Muzz. <laughs> And who is uh, who Corey is Danny Levin. Aykroyd? Corey Levin. Oh my front. God! Yeah. Sure. Now I'm her. saying, you, if you guys, did you show up and say, "Guess who I am"? And no one could guess well, we who you were. We went to two parties. One was like a small house party, and nobody got it. But then we went to a comedy club that was throwing a party, yeah. and everybody got it and oh, loved it. Oh my lord! Yeah. Well, as the West Side Comedy Theater, they all understood what was happening. Man, oh man! Is it? Tell me, has it has it reached cult status? Our our our, our dragnet. Uh, I uh, love that movie dearly, and I my friend uh, Corey and I quote it quite a bit. And there were yeah. quite. Amal Muzz. I mean, what are we talking we, about? And we got stopped by a lot of people Amal. to ask us to do the goat dance. Oh, and, the goat. Dance, yeah, yeah which, we shot in, which we shot in San Pedro, I'll have you know. Throw the photo back up. They, Jamie found goat heads. No, I made to, goat. I made no, you made them. To yeah. put on these sticks. Lighting. Oh, no, I had the goat stick. I yeah. was so into my undercover costume. That's right. There, I, I, I wanted to say, look, I want, I want to look like, you know, a Vato youth gang kind of guy. <laughs> and that what the the mustache and the thing. I was, I had been working out a little bit, and I was kind of proud of my arms. Really? Yeah, I had so can I have a short sleve shirt that's yes. kind of like pegged it right about it. That. That so I had just a little bit of a a little bit of you know muscle cleavage <laughs> there, just a tiny bit. Yeah. So yeah. that was your one shot. Was vanity. That. that was, was it. Amo Muzz. That, uh, that's uh, when I saw the end result. I said, I'm never doing that again. I'll just wear whatever they tell me to do it. I'm never going to try to to make that happen again. Also, because I studied this movie quite a bit to replicate these costumes, your shirt was pretty much unbuttoned. Like yes, years. it was. <laughs> Another thing. Yeah, I was going for like a Puerto Rican Latin yes. American. And kind of like, you know, kind of like thing. Yes, I was trying to drink a lot of horchata, you know, on the set, you know, trying to do that. You know what horchata is? Please tell me. Del delicious rice drink that is like manna from heaven. You can get it at almost any non-France.
franchise Mexican food taco stand, horchata. I can't. And so damn good. Not for good you. for a man with type two diabetes no. these days. But now a thing about Dragnet. We did the the fabulous rock video. Yes. To City of Crime. Now remember this era when every network, or maybe it was only NBC, had late night. You know it. You have no, a reference. I thought you were going somewhere else. I thought you were going to go with the era of like when like movies in the eighties had their own like titular song. They did. Which I talk about all the time, and I'm like, movies should still absolutely have. And they all made videos starring the people who recorded the song and like I did a movie I did a video with the Thompson twins or the remaining Thompson twins because they had broken up for uh, nothing in common we went to Chicago and shot it over a day and we shot uh, City of Crime with a bunch of dancers that was choreographed by Paula Abdul she Whoa. was the choreographer of it and it okay this was this is this is all coming together because <laughs> At the advent of the YouTube on the internet, on the <laughs> www dot dot internet dot, um, uh, we were sitting around the house one day and, and um, uh, we were having dinner and my kids were younger. I don't know what year this was. And uh, Rita started making fun of me, my wife, about the goofy dance I did with Paula. The name Paula Abdul came up. I said, well, she choreographed that. And my younger kids said, what was this? What are you talking about, Dad? Well. You used to make rock videos that would show on like, what was the name of the show? Uh, Friday Night Videos on NBC or something like that? Yeah, Remember that's what that? it was. Um, uh, when they were trying to like compete with MTV and so they throw a video show on that. And it was always people promoting their movies, you know, like, like Romancing the Stone. That's you know, right. They, they do a video. And so we were on and we were describing this, this goofy, you know, video where I had to dance. And my, my son, Chet, went berserk at the, at the thought of this. <laughs> and he says, well, where, where is it? I said, well, it's probably on a VHS cassette somewhere down in the basement in a box. And he ran to the other room, came back with the early laptop computer, and found it on YouTube in 90 seconds. I'm sure he did. And I said, well, the future is here, and it's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's We've all, come it's full all circle. We have. Now that's great. So now I'm empowering my 12-year-old son to always, always be able to ridicule his dad. It's actually, it was a, it was a fun day of shooting, but we kind of ran out of time when we, when we did it. But it was, uh, you could slap that on. If, actually, if you're watching this on YouTube, just wait till the end of the thing and then put in City of Crime, Tom Dragnet, you'll see it. <laughs> Choreographed by Paula Abdul. So there should have been uh, the titular song for, let's say, Cast Away. I wonder what that would have uh, been. We, well, would you write the song? You like to compose it for it? Yeah. Like the I way don't know, that could have had something. Uh, Bob always wanted to use Elvis Presley's Return to Sender and uh -huh. uh, Bobby Darren's, you know, Somewhere Across the Sea. There's a bunch of like those kind of references, but it didn't have an all encompassing. Themed. No. The thing I found about Nothing in Common in the dossier that was surprising, that I didn't know, that is to say, uh, was that you were involved in the, the development. It was a big turning point in terms of you being involved in the yes, development yes. of material before the director, in this case Gary Marshall, was brought in and hired. Well, actually it was pretty much hand in hand with, uh, with Gary. Uh, the script existed. It was written by a comedian. Do you have the names offhand? Is it in your dossier? It'll be brought forth and thrown up on the screen in a matter of seconds. A, so you keep a, going. Uh, the, a very talented comedian uh, and, and a screenwriter. It was really a sort of a, uh, a autobiographic, autobiographical story. Mm -hmm. And they, 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 they wrote it, and it, it, it was a fine blueprint on which to start. And we were, uh, I, w I felt as though it needed something more and I didn't I was neither in the position nor did I have any understanding of how to to promote other than to complain to the right I don't like it it should be more why can't it be this why can't it be that yeah. I was one of those guys and when Gary became a possible director for it we talked about what to do with it so Gary invited Gary Marshall invited me into the process of shaping where it was going to go next, and that was the first time that that had ever happened. And that's kind of you gotta you gotta warrant that. I think you know you have to prove that you're not going to be a dick. You, you can't know. put that Rick in the hands Padel of the wrong Michael person. Preminger. Michael Preminger. Rick Padell and Michael Preminger. Yes. Rick Padell was the comedian. He had done some comedy. I remember Rick Padell. Okay, yeah. yeah, he and, was and, a Greatest American Hero. He uh, uh, was an actor in that. There movie. you go. There yeah. you go. Um, that is a responsibility that an actor thinks they want until they're given it, and then they're either good at it or they aren't. Oh, it can unravel. You know, yeah. the, the joke is, oh, let's just get rid of this one little loose strand. Next thing you know, you got no sweater. That, that happens a lot.
But it was the beginning of the what would become Playtone, where, where that is to say, you weren't a full-fledged production company in any way, shape, or form. Oh, no, not at all. And Even uh, the development deals you had were just about you being talented. Well, you go through an ego thing where you think that, well, now, want, don't you want my notes on the script? You know, <laughs> I might be playing the guy. I think you'd want to hear some of the ideas I have for where the script should go. I'll tell you what, actor boy, why don't you wait in your trailer? And we'll... Uh... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just like completely full. Oh, I'm going to be all sulky now. I'm mad. They're not treating me seriously. I, we didn't start Playtone in, until that, uh, that thing you do. Right. Uh, which was written. And actually, it was done in tandem with uh, Jonathan Demme's Clinica Aesthetico. Because uh, I was talking to him at some point. He said, what do you want to do? Well, I'll help you do that. I'll help you uh, do that. And that was done with his auspices. And Gary uh, Getzman, who yeah. is... Uh, he, he is... Uh, he is the tone to my play, Indeed. or vice versa, depending on what crowd we're in. Mm -hmm. uh, I go to I go to like some like music industry things, and they all say, "Hey, Tom, good to see. You. Hey, is Gary around?" They all want to just hang out with yeah. Gary. Yeah. Um, he and I. That's where he and I got together, and we said, "Hey, this is you know, let's keep doing this. This is kind of this is fun." Right. And you're not at the mercy of waiting for the phone to ring, which was you know that's that, that's a, as you know. You got to generate your own stuff. Be proactive. Yeah, just yeah. just so you have an opp opportunity. You're not just asking for permission to be in things. The best thing I stumbled across was if you're not creating, you're waiting. Yeah, yeah. You, you just look at the phone. You know. It's like, yeah. yeah. Why aren't they? <laughs> yeah. Saw this working. Now yeah. I've I've uh, given you credit for. Uh, Far too much. For a heads up that you gave me in terms of directing. Really? Uh, the moment you had with Tak Fujimoto, the great Tak Fujimoto, on th that thing you do, where you confessed to me. Oh, well, I asked you, what's the one moment as a first time director you'd like to have back? And you said, well, this one morning, I, maybe three or four in the morning, I had this epiphany. So I went into work and I went up to Tak and I said, listen, it's the scene in the theater when the guys come in. Why don't we start on that giant chandelier, that beautiful, incredible chandelier? And as they're saying their dialogue, we'll eventually just find them. And Tak said, mm hmm, okay, well, why don't we bring the actors in and let them rehearse the scene and then watch them and then we'll figure out where to put the camera, and you said, oh, right, like we do every other time, and why <laughs> like, am I... <laughs> which is what I want to do when I'm an actor in a movie, as opposed, yeah, yeah. There, the, uh, the, I have learned more about what not to do as a director as opposed to what do do, as a, what to do as a director. Right. It, that's why I have no instinctive thrust. And, and um, Tack, um, if you've seen the movie, if you're knowing the movie, um, after, after the guys play uh, at the uh, Wisconsin State Fair at the racetrack, mm -hmm. we have a scene that's when they find out they have the number seven record in the country and they're going to fly to Hollywood, they're going to fly to the coast. Um, we had, I had staged that because I was just so in love with the dialogue. You know, I just loved it when the actors said the words that I wrote that we <laughs> essentially had it staged in the dressing room. And, and Tak Fujimoto was over there looking at it like this. I said, hey, come here. <laughs> I said, yeah, what? And he marched me down the hallways underneath the grandstand, and there's a long, there's a long passageway that leads back over to the other side of the racetrack. He says, what if we just started them back there, and they're saying the dialogue, we carry them around, and then the scene ends, ends them entering the room as it's just taking place in the room. And I went, Okay. Because <laughs> it was like a thousand times better. So, and cinematic. Yeah, yeah. It's just the, the idea that uh, 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 a guy uh, like me who wrote it is too close to it and maybe does not. Do you not agree, sir, that you are not the first, <laughs> that you are not the expert to tell, to tell the cinematographer what the shot should be? Maybe you should find out what the actors can do and then play off of that. Yeah. Outside of, you know, the bigger choreographed uh, beats. There was only one thing in that movie that was exactly as I imagined it would, like literally down to drawing the storyboards, and that was the scene where they hear their, uh, their record on the radio for the first time. And they're running around. And one's running and then meets up with somebody else and guys in and he hears it and they run in and a car screeches up. That's the only, that's the only one that actually, that's the only sequence was actually in my head uh, that, that that lived to, to all the other sequences, meaning that all the other sequences that, went, that were in my head that we shot, 
sucked. And, <laughs> and we had to do something other than those things. It's just the way it works out. Well, uh, in terms of writing and directing, you know, I keep going back to Barry Levinson, but in this case it's appropriate because he said, uh, or insisted his work was done in the writing and the casting, and then it was up to the DP to help him figure out how to do Well, he's a filmmaker, yeah. so yeah, he knows what to do. Yeah. Um, I have to t uh, tell you that Electric City is stunning and amazing. <gasps> Wow. Stunning and amazing. God bless you. No, no, no. no. Holy smokes. My dear friend and your uh, co-star in it, Jason Antoon, uh, does the little uh, Danny DeVito looking sinister. Oh, oh, God, he's great. Yeah, yeah. he's amazing. He plays Knobs Butler. Yeah. Holy cow. He wow. turned me on to it, and it's spectacular. And this is just it's some... an odd little thing, isn't it? Yeah. 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 But th what was the genesis of that? Because, man, oh, man, is it a lot of work. Uh, it, oh, dear Lord. I think we worked on that for four years. Oh, God. Meeting after meeting after meeting. The desire, <laughs> the desire was to do something that could exist without any rules attached to it. Right. That it was for a modicum amount of money. I mean, I, I didn't get, I didn't, I, got, I didn't get, I didn't make anything. You spent little. money. We spent money on that, but we got it from Relativity and a few other, I don't know if we got it from anybody else. We paid the salaries of everybody who worked on it. Um, uh, uh, and that's it. You know, there's no profit to be made on it per se, except by the end. We had a great animation house. Six Point Harness was the name of it. We had great actors that came in animation. that we paid. We paid them. They got, you know, they got the deal that uh, was the gold standard of doing, I guess, that kind of thing. But the desire was to tell a story that had, that had no boundaries on it, that we could literally, if we could make it up, it could be drawn. We went through a, um, we were going to originally try to do it like Fireball XL5. Oh, wow. Puppets, puppetries, and we found out they were just, we talked to a great puppet house out in the valley, as well as the Team America guys, yeah. who just said, you don't understand, it, if it takes a long time to do it with real people, it takes five times as long to do it with puppets. Yeah. So that was prohibitively constraining, both time-wise and money-wise. And so, well, what do we do? And so we came up with this animation kind of angle and let some people run right. But the great fun the thing that we kept coming back into it over, over and over again is telling this really outlandishly wild story set in this place that doesn't really exist yeah. and coming up with mostly backstory that plays itself out as the story itself. The, the history of the Electric City impacts every scene that happens in the Electric City. And if you haven't seen it, you don't know what the hell we're talking about. But you can find it on the Internet. Still. Well, it's a great app now to play on the mobile, on, on, the, on the iPhone. I mean, this is one of Oh, the yeah, ones. that's what we were shooting for. Yeah. That it would, uh, and the guys from Relatively came over and said, uh, I, I said, why do you, from India, so why do, you guys, why do you guys want to even talk to us about something like this? And they said, because there are one billion phones in India. <laughs> A billion. Yeah. Well, let's go for that audience. <laughs> let's try to make that happen. Yeah. And so uh, we did. And it was a long time, but we, you know, and we did. You know, then you get into like, I couldn't understand. I thought, can't we just put it out? Can't we just like, how do you do that? Can you just put it on YouTube and it would live that way? Which I guess it does. But we entered into a thing with Yahoo that went through, Yahoo went through nine regime changes from the moment we started with them to the moment that it actually that came out. That doesn't help. It did not help. And then we ended up sitting on it for a really long time, and I kept saying, why are we sitting on this? It's done. Just just put it out. Yeah. But the story was the thing that I just always dug. We would get together, the four of us, and just dream and come up with stuff. And, uh, and uh, without the rules of, you know, we, nobody gave us notes. We literally just... We were hands on. It's the thing we I say to everybody. Oh, you want to make you want to be in the movie? Make movies. You you got the cameras. You, do you have a bed that you can sit on and edit on your laptop? Well, then you have everything you need. Yeah. Go off and make something. Have you seen the people that recreate with incredibly startlingly great production values unseen Star Trek episodes? No. The original. I mean, I'm talking about the, you know, the, the velour shorts and the, sure. and the paper mache rocks. There's some, I don't know where are they, in South Carolina or something like that? They started doing it, and I swear to God, they look exactly, I mean, the actors are different, they're, they're, they're sure. amateur actors, but it looks exactly like the Starship Enterprise yeah. and the bridge, and the only thing that doesn't, the sound, they don't quite have the money in order to 
to record of the, the sound. the elevator door opening? No, they have that. <laughs> they have that. It's literally the production value from the right. from the boom mics and stuff like that. I don't know if they can afford a sound. Base. But if you have, have you seen it, I think they're trying to raise money to do it. Anybody here, young people? Finger on your pulse of the Internet? Over here, we've seen it. Two people yeah, have seen yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Pretty interesting. Are they still doing it, do you know? Uh, I'm not aware. We'll get on that and have yeah, a report please. on the desk first thing. <laughs> You've got three minutes. First um, thing in the morning. Because I love Star Trek. <laughs> Star Trek is great. How about our, our buddy? Let's have some clutch. <laughs> How about our buddy Ron's film Rush? God, I love that movie. Love it to death. You know what the thing is? Uh, let's just say that Americans don't understand Formula, Formula One, One racing, no. which I have to admit, I don't know anything about. But that was a great movie. It puts you inside the cockpit. The same DP that did um, that one for Danny Boyle on uh, um, uh, the, the India set. Oh, oh uh, 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 Slumdog uh, uh, Millionaire. Yeah, yeah. Slumdog Slum Millionaire. Dog Millionaire. Same DP from that movie reinvented how to put the camera inside the car and Un make you feel like you're in it. Unbelievable. Yeah, Unbelievable. truly astonishing. Unbelievable movie. He got the Golden Globe nomination. As did you, congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah. Daniel Balud was awfully good in that movie as Nicky Lauda. Yeah. Was he not fantastic? From Inglorious Bastards. That's right. Yeah. Jeez, this guy, this guy is it's um, he's three amazing. degrees. He is amazing. I don't know why Kevin Bacon needs seven degrees. It's three degrees of Santa. Three, de see, three degrees <laughs> and, of And I've been in a film with Paxton. Yes. Get out. What did you do with Paxton? Uh, we made a, a little movie called Club Dread which is a very goofy comedy. <laughs> the same guys who did Super Troopers, it was their follow-up. And uh, Usually they say a little buddy, thing. Buddy, <laughs> it's called Club Dread. That's Bill Paxson. Yeah. <laughs> buddy, I can't believe they're asking us to do this now. Dude, I'm making a movie called Club Dread. <laughs> That's Bill Paxson, the most enthusiastic man on the planet. Jamie invented a great game called Paxson or Pullman, Bridges or Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, a League of Their Own is one of my favorite ones to throw out for that. That's right. Oh, yeah, Bill Pullman. Yeah, that's Bill right. Pullman. That's people right. He has like one scene, so people forget. Yeah, yes, he does. Yeah. He was uh, uh, Gina's uh, fiance. Mm -hmm. That's right. What can you tell us uh, oh. about K Blows Top, Jack Johnson, or American Gods? These are the three things. Uh, things in foreign, you know, in development pipeline, the type of thing that may happen if they're great. But it, 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 people, you know, the, the fact is you, you have this. You know how you have down, you drove down the freeway, you go past Long Beach, there's big tanks that are just full of oil. Yeah. That's what, there's where though, they're just in tanks full of oil. That's and right. Now, it will eventually maybe, they'll get refined into gasoline or, you know, some Valvoline or something like that. But <laughs> some things just sit because they are waiting for either a person or a talent or a vision to come along and crack the nut. But also there, there's a lot of stuff that, that you kind of, well, okay, this theme is being examined by this story, but what is the media that is both best going to right. allow us to examine the theme? Like, Electric City was an example. There was only, there's only one way we've di discovered to do that in these odd three-minute episodes that, right. you know, the total, I think, two hours of, of, uh, of entertainment. Uh, uh, but then other, other things need to be miniseries, and other things need to be motion pictures, and other things to me need to be regular series, and we just got to figure it out. Yeah. It's hard work. We asked uh, your fans in the interwebs uh, to forward us some questions. On via, the intranets? Via Twitter or otherwise. Um, Steven C.G. Rankin uh, asked, what actor, actress has taught you the most? Ah. Not a bad question. Is that, okay. Is that like as you worked with them? and As opposed to sitting down you and working on a math problem? Well, yes. no. I mean, as opposed to watching their movies and saying, hey, I'd like to be like, you like know, that. what? Dealer's choice. Well. You tell me. Uh, Watching actors perform in movies are it, it, that that's the type of that's a, that's the inspirational um, and aspirational thing. You say I want to be able to do something like for me it was Jason Robards, Jason Robards and um, uh, 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 Robert Duvall. Yeah. When I was when I was in college, went, these were the guys that I looked at and they said because they weren't the they weren't the the idols. No, nope. they weren't like the John Waynes or the Lee Marvins or the Steve McQueens. They were these other guys, and they were always delivering this thing with thought behind the eyes that was mysterious to right. me. So that's what that was the aspiration. But when you start working actually with people and you see how they do it, I, I made a movie with Sandy Bullock mm -hmm. called Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close. And she and I only had one scene together, but we were always rehearsing, and I saw some other stuff that she did. And she has this, she has a tendency 
um, in which I swear to God, I don't, I don't hear any dialogue. She's delivering stuff that was written down on paper, written down on paper, but it does not come out as dialogue. It comes out as, as conversation. And I don't know how she wow. necessarily suspends the self-consciousness of being an actor and make it come out that way. I, I, I probably l learned a lot from, quite frankly, from actresses. Yeah. Uh, Halle Berry is another one. She is she is effortless. She just there is no there's no artifice that comes out of it. She just says it like so simple. I made a movie called uh, Cloud Atlas with sure. her. We we worked together quite a bit on that. Yeah. And I, I always found her to be confounding. I said, how do you how do you do that? How do you just say it like that? I'm here. You know, I feel like I'm I'm acting with chickens on my shoulders. You know, you know, trying to you know steer things in certain directions. And she just would, would be kind of like placid and say it from a very, and it was tough dialogue sometimes, but it came out like that. Uh, I learned from people who make it um, that just have a tendency to, to do it. Right. Just to say it quite simply, straight out of their face. And you said something to the effect about Gleason was like that, where he didn't apologize for anything or make excuses for anything. Oh, he okay. showed up and just did it. Well, he was, you know, entertainer par excellence. Um, uh, he, he, well, you get into that kind of he, man. That, that was an intimidating gig. I, I had to, I had to, I had to make a decision not to be a pain in the ass around <laughs> around Jackie Gleason. Right. I didn't want to talk too much. I didn't want to ask him questions. Right. I wanted to be a peer. We, I was playing his son, so I wanted to maintain a degree of. Uh, I was intimidated by him, but like, uh, and his. Uh, his ability just to bark it out um, with no no artifice was yeah. uh, you know, well. That, that's how the greats do it. Paul Newman on uh, on uh, he did, Paul Newman on on uh, Road, to Road to Perdition did the great. He gave us all the greatest gift in the world. It was the first day of shooting. We were shooting a huge. Um, I think it was it was a wake for yeah. a guy who died. Actually, a guy who I think I killed. Yep. Uh, and uh, Paul Newman ordered me to kill him, so all this stuff went down. And we're, it's, it's a room full of, of actors, day players, and we're all dancing the way the Irish do and stuff like that. And he had to get up and make a big speech to, you know, here's to the devil and whatnot. And so it's the first day of shooting, oh, God. and he gets up and does it. And we're all thinking, we're all thinking the same thing. We're in the room with Paul Newman. Paul Newman is going to act for it. And he did it. And as soon as he was done with his lines, he, he, ra he had a glass, he raised up his glass, and as soon as he was done with it, he said, it's pretty intimidating the first day, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and everybody, yeah, I just said, oh, thank God he feels that way. Yeah. He's as self-conscious as we all are. And he laughed, and we all laughed, and then after that it was all fine. But yeah. he, uh, so he, the, 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 it doesn't. You know, it doesn't change just because you're you're Paul Newman. There's, oh, I got to tell you, while everyone's swinging for the fences with between Daniel Craig trying to establish himself brilliantly, uh, which he did, Jude Law. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, as, we had as those a guys character in actor. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. you, as the uh, muscle, the <laughs> yeah. sociopath muscle, yeah, who ends up does having a conscious, uh, was such a different turn. Um, I wasn't sure if you said yes because it was Paul Newman or because you, it was this character that was no. That was a that was the character there. Yeah. Just uh, uh, and uh, nowhere near the center of anything you'd done. Uh, no, yeah, that was yeah, that was some new thing. But you know, I was older and you know, it, it was time. And if I may, please. Tradition. Great movie, but the darkest of the Bing Crosby, Bob Hope series, I think. <laughs> Road to Perdition, yeah. yeah. It had a thing. It had. Well, you know. That joke's for your grandparents. Once you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> once you replace, you know. Myrna Loy with. Yeah, yeah, with, uh, you know, Pam Anderson. It just, you know, it just didn't. Not the same. Just, just didn't work. Yeah. It was the coldest. There was a day where uh, uh, it was, the, the great exciting thing about that. It, uh, it was shot by uh, um, Conrad. Conrad, the RDP. Yeah, and he and Paul knew each other from you know years ago. And there, he, 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 we were out. Conrad in, Hall. Sorry. Conrad. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, be, Conrad uh, Hall. Jeez, Conrad Hall. One of the greatest cinematographers oh. of all time. And it is a beautiful. It's like a Vandermeer painting. Stunning. You know? And uh, he said, "Hey, I'm seventy. I'm, I'm seventy-six years old. It's, I, I can't work anything. You don't like the way it's speed on work. Fire me." He was. He was not cantankerous. He was very. Very honest. We were shooting outside in February in like Joliet, Illinois, outside Chicago, cold as cold could be. 
and the scene called for there to be snow on the ground, but rain falling from the sky. That's what was required. So it's like the frigid winter took a turn for the warm, and so rain and was night the, shoot. It was night shoot. So it was three o'clock in the morning, and we had every type of fake snow that exists in the motion picture technological realm. We had just ro rolls of white paper. We had soap. We had plastic flakes. We had the guys just spraying that kind of like stuff that kind of like literally on Christmas trees flocking mm -hmm. it. So we had every kind of fake snow you could have on the ground. And then they brought out these rainbirds to sprinkle us with a heavy dose of, you know, Kur Kurosawa-like, uh, you know, dense rain. That's not the down it, it was, that you, you know, take out Newman in the end. No, 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 no. That, no, we had that, that too. Was a, but that was here. But that was shot in L.A. and it wasn't nearly as cold. I mean, it was freezing cold. So and because then and then it started to actually snow. So, Hello. So we were out trying to grab the shot at night with me and uh, and me and the boy who played my my son, who's a really great kid. Yeah. And uh, uh, it was like, okay, we've got uh, uh, Sam Mendes. So Sam, let me get this straight. We got the fake snow, paper on the ground. We got the fake rain coming down on us, soaking us wet in these clothes. And now we have the real snow that's joining it. So before we enter the shot that we have to dust our clothes off of the actual snow to be in the place. Well, this is just great thinking, I got to tell you. And it's three o'clock in the morning and it's, he laughed. It was about as miserable as you can get. And, uh, but uh, what are you going to do? Yeah, no. And that was, yeah, I, I killed Danny Craig in that thing. I shot him dead. Yeah. That, yes, you did. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> well, that was the thing about that, that muscle of that character, the quietness of that man. It just followed orders. Yeah. You know, he just, just did what he, what he was supposed to do. And the yeah. protective sense of looking yeah, out. Yeah, that hopefully, yeah, he, he wanted it not to, that, he wanted a better life. He, he didn't want his kids to be that way. You right. Know? And, yeah, but there is that moment of you walking down the hall and the gun just gets cocked to the <laughs> side. Yeah, yeah. That's cool stuff. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> Incredibly complicated. So I can't tell you how complicated that shot was to shoot. It was amazing. It was just amazing. Conrad Holt. That was, that was a great movie to make. That was a very interior movie. Very rarely in movies, were in, in a lot of the stuff, does the, uh, the director, Sam Mendes, come up and say, not so much, not so much. I said, really? <laughs> not so much, not so much. So there's, there's times when, on that movie, where this, this is literally the shot. That's too much. Literally. <laughs> yeah. He says, you know, what, what, what you don't want to look up? Just, yeah. yeah. Less, less, less. <laughs> Bring it on. I'll do, as, I'll do as little. Do you not agree that I should do less <laughs> in this? In this and, in but this I'll film? tell you, the effect is astounding because you are, uh, that character is more stoic and therefore more menacing. Yeah. Because yeah. of the lack of movement, yeah. because of the lack of expression. Yeah. It's the, the dead eyes of a shark. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which yeah, yeah, which was a blast. That's that's the reason to take that gig. We know what it's like, you know. In in, in when well, I got to shoot an AK-47 well, in the suspects. Well, you know, you're running around on a, uh, <laughs> the San usual Pedro. suspect. In San Pedro. San Pedro. Oh that's my right. God. The, the docks of San yeah, did Pedro. Did you get hurt? Uh, oh sure. Now I'm coming to tell you. You know, I'm uh, in the in the Robert Langdon movies, which I insist on calling them. Oh good. They're not the they're not the Da Vinci Code nope. movies. They're the Robert Langdon mystery. <laughs> Let's be clear. This is I I I'm not gonna I'm not gonna talk about these movies unless they're called the Robert Langdon mysteries. I love that memo. We were uh, uh, Zurer and I were in Rome and we had to run all over ancient Rome. Yeah, you did. And we did. We did it night after night, day after day. And all of ancient Rome is cobblestones, meaning that it's this unreal. We we came so close a million times to to twisting our ankles. And it actually hurt to run around Rome. And we got to jump out of cars and run into the Pantheon. We got to jump out of cars and run into, run into the Chigi Chapel. We got to jump out of cars and run into the Castle San Angelo. Run and run and run and run and run. And if just for a gag, say you want to turn on those scenes of us running, just just say this as you see us running. Ow, 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 ow. Because we're all running, trying, trying to maintain, not yeah. trip or fall. We're all wearing special running shoes. But it hurt running on these things after a while because you're landing on these sharp, uneven kind of things. The fact is nobody runs in ancient Rome. No, the nobody reason, did. there's a reason the Romans ran barefoot. Yes, but of course they weren't trying to track down the Illuminati, were they, like we were. We were trying to, we were trying to save the Pope, so that requires speed, that, foot speed. No. Um, okay.
Uh, let's see if there's. I want to make sure that the uh, the, the wonderful is, the wonderful the viewers who are kind enough to to actually write these questions. You, I'm sure you've got easily a couple of hundred viewers, and I'm sure twelve <laughs> of them might have questions. Brooke I, McMaster, though these questions were sent in and uh, watching live. Brooke McMaster, what is the first film you saw that made you fall in love with acting? We I think we might have covered. Uh, that. Uh, fall in love with it. Like, 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 ooh, how do you do that? Yeah. I don't know. It's probably like Sons of Katie Elder or something like that. That's what my dad took me to. You see the Sons of Katie Elder? Sure. John Wayne, uh, Dean Martin? Yes. Earl Holloman? Yes. Uh, somebody else playing fist fighting the Sons of Katie Elder? That was probably one of the coolest movies I've ever seen. Or, as a kid, The Great Escape, man. Oh, Come on. Forget it. Come on. I, I once ran into the late uh, James Coburn. Mm. At a party, and you know, you know, you know what this likes. When you when you meet your idols, you you want to be cool. You don't want to say, "Oh man, I loved you," and blah blah blah. But I said, I I, I said, look, forgive me, uh, Jimmy. Is this a man called Flint? No, I just said, can you just give me just anything from The Great Escape? Can you just? Because I said, look, I, I'm a guy, and if someone said, hey, would you like to go off with twenty of the other guys that are working in movies right now? And hang out and wear old uniforms and run away and be prisoners of war and do. Would you like to do? I would do that on a bet. I, I, I said, did you not just have the greatest time of your life, making that movie? And he said, yeah, it was pretty great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. good times at the hotel. You know that kind of thing. Because oh. look at it. It was just like yeah. James Garner and Steve McQueen and him yeah. and uh, Charles Bronson. Well, you look uh, at all Kel those English guys. Kelly's Heroes, Dirty Dozen. Oh God, Kelly's Heroes, man, oh man. When I saw Don Rickles being serious, although he was, you know, getting laughs, but it's a dramatic performance. Yeah, I thought that's well, as good as a submarine movie, you know. Yeah. Run silent, run deep, man. That 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 that's just. You know, I'm such a sucker for that stuff. Yeah. But sons of Katie Elder to answer the guy's question, something like that. When you're young. Yeah. Cat Baloo for me. Okay, sure. Cat Baloo, right. really? Right. Why? Sure. Stubby K? Yep. You saw it say, I could, I could play him. That's right, because I saw him hosting shenanigans. <laughs> it's Stubby, K. I, Stubby K. I'm here to tell you shenanigans. Stubby yeah. K and uh, Nat, King, Nat Cole King Cole as the, uh, as the minstrels. They're sort are, of the narrator. sort of like the core eye, yeah. the chorus. Yeah. For me, yeah. it's Caligula, by the way, not the uh, <laughs> Caligula? The, uh, the, uh... No, uh the oh, that one, really? Oh, yeah, that Caligula. That's yeah, a good one. I've never seen that, but I hear it's pretty great. Who was who the who was the producer of that? The Penthouse Magazine oh, guy. Oh yeah, it was uh, Bob, Bob Guccione. Guccione. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Guccione. Bob Guccione's son, Faligula, went on Faligula. To, to carry the torch, I believe. Bob, oh really? Bob Guccione Jr. He had a music magazine, did he not? He was did. it Spin Magazine? Did he handle that or something? I think it so. It was Spin. Anyone to block? Spin. Yep. All right, two tone, more. Tone down the enthusiasm <laughs> over there, guys. <laughs> this guy over there said Spin. Uh, you've been on the Twitter yeah, for a while. <laughs> you've been on the Twitter for a while. People, I've done that, yeah. People want to know if it's actually you writing. Oh, absolutely. Please. Every yeah. one of those is me and the photographs that I take. You, you follow a select few. You follow the, are, you, are you actually reading other things that people are writing, though, or are you just popping no, in I every now and then? I don't. I don't. Why would you? <laughs> I, the, the life is long. Right. I mean, you know, life, uh, the day is short. Life is long, but the day is short. Then you have no choice but to join us for uh, 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 what's going to be an amazing uh, round of a game we like to call. Oh, really? Who Tweeted? Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. This is very I exciting. Celebrities now, have so much to say. Who tweeted? Is the game we're gonna play? Like postcards. Mm -hmm. Hey, I was here and saw this. That's all. That's all they are. <laughs> oh, it's exciting now. Do I look here, or are you gonna? No, I'm oh, I look here. I thought. <laughs> I thought we were gonna have you, a graphic and a thing, no. a survey says kind of thing. No, we're gonna go look to. up there. But this. All is right. Do be I need game. pencil and paper? No, no. You do not. He doesn't. Oh, you don't know them either. It's he a competition. Need, it is a competition. Is it multiple choice? Yes. All right. All right. Bring it on. So here's how the game works. It's Hold on, called... wait a minute. I need some smart juice. <laughs> By all means, sir. It's just my tweet elixir. <laughs> so the game is right. called Who Tweeted? All right. <laughs> and the authors of these tweets are either Tyra Banks, okay. Harris Hilton, oh, or Justin Bieber. Oh. Now we're home. The big three. Yeah. 
Oh, the, the the fun of this is neither of us follow any of them. Nope. Yeah. So it's catchers catch can. This is catch can. Yeah. But, See, here's how but, it works. But if you want to hit like our wheelhouse, you know, maybe Steve Martin, Mamie Eisenhower, and uh, <laughs> yes, somebody, maybe, maybe somebody. Eisenhower's <laughs> tweets, by the way, and not maybe what they used Peter to be. Marshall, <laughs> not what they used to be. <laughs> host, Peter Marshall, the host of uh, you know Hollywood. Hollywood Squares. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go to Tom Hanks in Center Square um, to block. So here's how it works. One at a time. I'm going to read a series of eight tweets. All right. Now who is it again? Paris Tyra. Hilton. Tyra, Paris, Paris or, or Bieber. Or Bieber, okay. I'll read the tweet. As soon as you feel like you know who wrote it, you ring in by saying your name. And then you get three seconds to say either Tyra, Paris, or Bieber. Oh, like you have somebody timing this back. <laughs> well, yeah. the problem is I used to not say that, and he'd ring in and then wait 20 seconds. Oh, I see. So, an so you can't say you can't I got it. You can't yeah. All right. Uh, so at the end of it, uh, you ring in, you get it right, you get yourself five points. Ring in, you get it wrong, you're going to lose three. At the end of eight, a winner will be crowned... <laughs> And walk I'm away. just knocked out by the production value. Oh, it's 20 bucks. <laughs> the production value of this game is essentially a clipboard from Staples. That's it. That's right. And all don't right, forget all about right. this okay, pen. How right. long do you think we took during the production meeting uh, <laughs> debating whether or not we would put Tom Hanks to the test all right, who playing tweeted? who tweeted? Tyra. Now, let, let me just let's go through this. Yes. Tyra, beautiful uh, fashion model, supermodel, had sure. her own talk show for yep. a while. Yep. Definitely an icon of fashion, yes. right? Yep. Uh, and opinionated in, uh, in ways. Utterly. Uh, okay. Paris Hilton, uh, celebrity par excellence, yep. uh, who built a bit of a, a an empire, empire, branded herself. She travels own. around the world, fragrances, fashions, music, music. Yep. She does that. Mm -hmm. And Justin Bieber, perhaps one of the hottest musical commodities going around in the world if right now. The, if not the uh, a fine young Canadian who's made well for himself, who has hit records, none of which I know. Nope. <laughs> nope. All right. So that all being said, that all are be you ready said. to play all who right. tweeted? Okay, let's say who tweeted. Here we go. All right. Tweet number one. I'm so happy right now. <laughs> happy Shh. birthday. Shh. All right. Happy birthday, Britney Spears. Hope it's amazing and that all your birthday wishes and dreams come true. Tom Hanks. I'm going with Justin Bieber. Oh, I'm so sorry, Damn. sir. You are... Do you get to answer no? No, he does not. Let's move on. Oh, really? On. We don't get to find out who? I'll tell you who, but now you're in the hole at negative three. That was Paris Hilton. Oh, Wish damn it. See? Brittany a happy birthday. That's all right. I was fooled by the enthusiasm. L oh, well, that's, that's all on my end. He's going to read them every time. Okay, yeah. all right, all right. Yeah. Here we go. Tweet number two. Just wanted to type Wait, something. Wait, can I ask a question? How many <laughs> are we hearing? Eight. Total oh, eight. eight. Okay, so it's not like three no, and one is each make, one. Okay. You've got time to so make it So it could up. be Justin Bieber again. All it right, could, yes. got it. It could be any three on any one given So if feet. I say Justin Bieber to all eight, I could probably end up even. <laughs> In theory. In theory. Okay, I'm just asking. I'm just working on my strategy. All right. All right. <laughs> tweet number two. No one has deconstructed who tweeted No before. one. No one. Hey, I'm competitive and I want <laughs> to win that $20. <laughs> oh, I sense it. I believe it. Just one. I'm not leaving here just with two empty paps from the ribbon. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping to leave this. Actually, we have a gift bag. Oh, yeah. really? Oh, oh, yeah. Remember that book you were kind enough to contribute to? There's a signed copy <laughs> oh, in that great. bag. And I'm sure they've got four more. Why of those I'm Funny Wait, by Kevin <laughs> Pollan. <laughs> All right, okay. All I right. Live to see the day. <laughs> here we go. Just wanted to type something. Ever feel that way? Kevin Bieber. Oh no! Wow. Tied oh. at negative three. <laughs> Tyra. Kicking Tyra. Tyra. Yeah, totally like a Are you telling me I'm saying it like a beaver. that I could tweet I just wanted to type something? Yeah. You could. In fact, Tyra tweeted that out to her, I don't know, eleven million followers, and man, they, oh they all man. allowed it. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> change, nice to know that Twitter, Twitter has that kind of power. Change the lives of a lot of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want to touch people, Tom. That's like Paul. He's, I just wanted to pass something, so I, you know, That's put right. a bill. Okay, all right. All right, here we go. Tie game, tweet number three. All right. Sending love to everyone with a dream. Tom Beans. Hanks. Yes, sir. Justin Bieber. <laughs> I'm sorry, no. <laughs> but I admire your strategy. <laughs> just sending love. All right. It was just sending love to everyone with a dream. Be inspired by Beyonce and think how to wow, surprise, and inspire people. Oh, well, that's Tyra. That Tyra would have been Banks. Tyra Banks. Of course. of course it would have been. Uh, maybe I should listen to the entire tweet. <laughs> All right. Your competitiveness. Uh, I am. Got I, out in front of you. I'm thinking that uh, potent potables for 800 hours. <laughs> I think there's like a there's a thing you got to hit before he's right. done with it. Yeah. I don't know. The trick there is you wanna you wanna push your buzzer as Alex is saying the last word. Got yes, exactly. That's what they tell right. you. All right. 
All uh, right, tweet all right. number this is four. This no, is I'm going to tell you right now, if I say my name, I'm saying Justin Bieber right after. <laughs> Fair enough. I say my name. This is going to plan a continuous loop tweet in my house, by the way, for about a month. <laughs> tweet number four. Great show. One more. Perth. Kevin Bieber. <laughs> Tom, where were you? You beat Come me! Come on! You saw me inhale. I, you got me on the inhale. Oh, oh dang. You could not have. So you're in the plus. That's sir. correct. Dang. You're up to That's zero? Correct. That makes he's, me worst host he's, ever, by the way. He's, yeah, thanks. He's I, at really plus two. I told you what I was going to say. Negative six. It's I all right. I told you what I was going to say. I can't be competitive also. And, oh, by the way, now I'm a sucker. I'm waiting for the rest of the tweet. Right. There is no rest no, of the tweet. No, that was it. It that was, was it. over. It, it was, was done. over. They're not summer a few all words, right. some sentences. All, all right, right, all right. Worth the price of admission. <laughs> all right. All right. Who tweeted? Right. No, there's still time to turn How this around. How many do we have left? <laughs> We're halfway through. You got four left. Four left, all right. Yeah, four left. All right. Time to turn it all around. All right. With tweet number five. All right. So you know when peeps are speaking in another language in front of you and about you thinking you don't understand? Hanks. Paris Hilton. Oh, so close. <laughs> Tyra Banks. What? Tyra Banks. Who speaks of her in a foreign language? Tyra Banks. I refuse that question. You know, I've never seen Tyra Banks <laughs> and Paris Hilton in the same room at the same time. <laughs> there you go. They I could think, be, they could be, uh, you know, monikers, do doppelgangers I for just, each other. I just want to say for the record, if we finish this and you've not answered one correctly, I will strike this from the show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to beg you not to. I will beg you. All right. We're going to. All right. We're, we're, okay. Here we Wait, go. I've been wrong with. Two Justin Beavers and one Paris Hilton. That's okay, correct. All right. It's yeah, all right, though. This is a tough game. This but I would have got the Beaver. You would have gotten it. All right. All <laughs> Tweet right. I should give number me. six. Going to bed. Have to be up in a few hours for the fight. I can't believe I'm going to a boxing match at 9.30 a.m. Hashtag early flight. Hashtag Team Pacquiao. Hanks. <laughs> Banks. Tyra Banks. <laughs> That's Bieber. That's Paris. I'm so sorry. That's Paris. Whoa! He always goes to those fights. What fights? <laughs> what, what fights? The Pacquiao. It's probably in Vegas. The boxing. Right? Yeah. Oh, that was on yeah. at 9 30 in the morning? Well, she had to get a 9 30 flight. Yeah. Dear Lord, if you can hear me. <laughs> Let Tom Hanks get one right. Just one. You know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna wear this like God. a badge. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna be proud of this. All right, before before I just want you to remember your original strategy. My question is Okay, thank you very much. I just want you to, you were on to something. All right. Tweet number seven. Hanks Beaver. That's correct. Thank you. That's correct. I got one. Right there. I knew it. Not even gonna read it. I knew it because of uh, <laughs> That's classic. The slight twist. That's classic. And the, uh, what a, was the tweet, by the way? You are all beautiful. You are all beautiful. See, I would have said Tyra Banks. Yeah, yeah. Jeez, thank Make goodness I have a strategy. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, our eighth and final tweet worth right. 10 points, worth as 10 we all points. know. Really? As always. This is oh it. Chance to steal. So if, if you ring in and get this one, the game is yours, my friend. You'll be right, plus three right. to plus two. I'm not going to answer. I'm just going to let you sit back. Right. At sound check for my performance tonight at Cavalli Club, it's going to be an incredible night. Hanks. Hilton. Yes! That is correct! Yeah. Oh, I can't even. Come on behind. That's how you do it, sir. Come There's on behind. No. There's no, and that, man, oh man. that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you play Who Tweeted. It's because I waited to the very end. That's the reason why. Thank you very much. Wow. Champion. Celebrities have so much to say. Who Tweeted? Is, is that the game that we just play? Hey, he's on the far left there, yeah. I'm very, oh, that was impressive. very Semitic. In that. <clears throat> oh my goodness! All I can say is there'll be Christmas at the house after all. <laughs> Have a holly jolly Christmas! It's the best time of the year. Oh my! <laughs> oh, the dancing Andrew Jackson saves the day once again. Uh, there, I can't thank you enough. Uh, I'll see you in four years for the reunion. Show when will when this will be a hologram <laughs> that will be That's three exactly dimensional. Right. By the way, and look at this wad that I'm adding this. Oh yeah. my! Holy tamale! Somebody got some per diem and a dollar. <laughs>
How about per diem, by the way? Oh, God. I haven't asked any, a guest in 190 shows, and damn it, I'm glad I thought of it. Per diem. It doesn't matter how much the, the, the actor makes. You're on location. Uh, uh, you know, number one, the call list down to whatever. Whatever that number is, be it $60 or 6000 whatever that per diem is, because the system takes the paycheck. The paycheck doesn't come to the actor. It goes to the system. And then the bills come and you sign the thing, but there's no money other than that crazy mm -hmm. per diem. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter how much it is. It's actually cash. They deliver you to the thing they in the envelope. They hand it to you. You can't believe it. In an envelope. It. Yeah, and I've seen giant movie stars get to per diem and treat it like it's the most important money in their lives. It's like you're just walking by the crap table and they say, sir, you're winning. I mean, you didn't even play. It's like, it's fantastic. It is great. <coughs> and by the way, there's nothing. It's I think the the perfect amount of per diem. Three hundred dollars. I was going to say one hundred eighty. <laughs> I'm assuming you. the room is paid for. You yeah. know. So a hundred. And you're bucks, eating on the set. Geez, it's Yeah. Your most, meals. Most of the lunches are at work. They yeah. got you a rent a car. It is really. It, it is. It is great. What are we talking about here? It's, it's one hundred eighty dollars. Simple pleasures are the best, my friend. That's going right in the pocket. All right. To close out the show, the long-standing tradition of one hundred ninety shows, other than maybe a couple of Brits, is that we stare down the barrel. When you're ready, sir, you've got to play the Larry King game, and this is very simple. Larry, God bless. It's connected you. to New York. That's you're on the air. That's how it will end. Really. Okay. You're going to do a bad Larry King impression. I don't want a good oh, one. Oh, jeez. Okay. <clears throat> and right before Larry goes to the phone, he looks in the camera and he shares something about himself that mm. nobody wants to know. Really? And then he goes to the phone. So you're Larry King. That's the moment I'm looking for you okay, to create. Okay, I'm Larry King. And, and right before you go to Schenectady, pick any town. The funny okay. sounding is good. Okay. You look in the camera and you share something about yourself as Larry. We don't want any Tom Hanks information. Got you're it. Larry. I want you deep into Larry King. And you look in that camera, anything about Larry that nobody wanted to know, and then go to the phones. That's the Larry King game, and here is Tom Hanks. All right, ready? <clears throat> Larry King asking the questions that you want answered from the people that you want answers from. Good news, I just flipped my condo in Miami Beach, doubled my money right off the bat, feeling mighty rich, feeling mighty good. Rochester, New York, <laughs> you're on with Penny Marshall. <laughs> How's that? Just slipped a condo in Miami Beach. Oh, my. I'm assuming he still has a condo. He better. <laughs> I now, hope you know, there was a period of time where Larry King was the only show to do on the Celebrity Mule Train. Yeah. The one only one. The, the other ones were, you know, you want to do a Letterman. Sure. You certainly wanted to do any. Carson. You want to do Carson yeah. because of the, 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 the spiritual juju that it got. But as far as reaching a worldwide audience. Mutual Larry radio. Larry King. It was, all, it was all around the world. Yeah. Larry King. Yeah. And before the CNN, the Mutual Radio, he had that overnight radio oh, yeah, show yeah. that was spectacular. You ever, you ever been like on a long, long drive and landed on that and have it yes. saved your life a yes. couple of times? I was on a long drive down from Northern California once, and I listened to Larry Crown from, honestly, from... Kettle, Kettleman City, straight down to uh, the Grapevine, man. And yeah. It was, it was After beautiful. a stand-up gig, I would listen to him. You'd do a gig way out in Sausalito, where it's one of the suburbs around San Francisco, and you would drive. Beautiful. In. Yeah. Not for nothing, you just said Larry Crown. So. Did I really? Instead of Larry King. We're on to you. I'm going to go with Pat. Well, that's it. <laughs> I'm going to go with Pat's the block. <laughs> Peter. I said Larry Crown. <laughs> we'll play it back for they you. They never leave you, man. They're like your, they're like your children. children. You yeah. think about them for the rest of your life. Um. Thank you so much. Oh, my, you know what? This was fun. Right? Thank you. Yes, it was you, great. You ended up having a good time. Be careful. Be careful. Don't put up too much of a fun thing. <laughs> Don't have too much of a good show. And how about Next thing you know, you got Joseph Gordon Levitt sitting here talking about his movies. Oh, no. No, no, he's a good guy. I, mean, I, just, <laughs> I just, his name makes me laugh. That's, you know how many, you know that there's a lot of three named actors yeah. now? Let's go over them. Do now. you know why? Why? Well, my, because when you join the, the guild, you got to make sure nobody. You got to make sure nobody else has the same name. Michael J. Fox added the J. That's that right? Because yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I'm the poster child for the very famous Broadway actor Sam Levine. Well, exactly right. Sam had to add an M. Two M's. Two really? M's. Really? Which does not look like an affectation. It sounds the same though. It so. does. It does. Spoken, you'd never. Sam have a difference. Levine. <laughs> Indeed. Mm. Um, my name's Jamie Fox. Her name yeah, is are you in, are you in are you in the Screen Actors Guild? No, what if I wasn't? Well, there you go. You, what would you change it to? <laughs> well, I would use my Jamie name. Foxy. Eric Bishop. <laughs> Erica, Erica Bishop. Hello. <laughs> Have you met my wife, Jamie Foxy? <laughs> yeah. By the way, imagine being twelve with the name Jamie Fox, and then an actor decides to become famous. 
and then for the rest of your life, it's... Yeah, everybody's always... Uh, well, you know, the, remember when Matt Dillon was, uh, became the sensation that he was? Yes. He's named after the, the guy from Gunsmoke. And yeah. Now, no one, no one says that. No. <laughs> no, one, no one says the name from Gunsmoke. But this has been fun. Thank you. Thank you, crack staff. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, enthusiastic <laughs> audience. And, and thank th you, uh, KP. It was a delight, I must say. Fun, uh, fun chat show. I couldn't be more relieved. And thanks you for saving Matt Damon, because we've appreciated that <laughs> over the years. <laughs> <laughs> Happy holidays to all the Hanks. Indeed. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, sit there uncomfortably while I wrap things up for the folks You at got home. it. All right. We'll be done. We'll be am, I, am I on camera? <laughs> hey, look, everybody. I'm Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> Ah. The Canadians know that oh boy. I'm not making fun no, of no. them. I'm it's just describing what it's like to be at a Saskatchewan Rough Riders game. <laughs> hey, Tom, what are you doing up here? Doing Alan Thick? <laughs> <laughs> That was a great show to do. I know. By uh, the way, everybody went to Canada to do the Alan Thick show. Oh man! All right, uh, Go ahead, hit it. I'm afraid that's it. We've just about hit the record here, two and a half hours. And don't tell Tom that's how long he was here. Uh, I want to thank everyone here in the studio uh, and around the world. Uh, Samantha Ward, wonderful makeup. Uh, Josh and and J Mac out there running the ship. Our own evil Dr. Chen, Sam and J J Jamie. And Danielle, our media maven, uh, happy holidays to each and every one of you. We're, we're done for the year. This is our 190th show and the last one of 2013. So happy holidays and happy new year. We'll see you, wait for it, next year. <laughs>